that they are playing tomorrow and not today. Okay. Okay. Um, the, uh, yeah. Hello. This is the beginning of the second day of the sixth Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. I hope the seventh will be called uh, more Euro Symposium on Healthy Longevity, but we'll see. Uh, welcome to the speakers, welcome to the participants. Uh, today will be dedicated uh, especially uh, around all aspects around uh, uh, advocacy for longevity and also around uh, sharing of big data, big data for healthy longevity, of course. Uh, today also I will put in the chat uh, the link to a document that I propose that we approve at the end of the meeting. You will have, uh, all of you, uh, you have access to comments and to make suggestions, but of course you can also make uh, comments uh, or suggestions at uh, the end of this meeting during the general discussions. Discussion, sorry. Um, a few technical aspects, please, uh, if you um, are not speaking, don't forget to mute yourself. Um, and uh, when you are speaking, uh, please don't forget to unmute yourself uh, and uh, also uh, to, uh, to use the video, except if you are very shy. Normally, you are all allowed uh, to share the screen, so there is no problem if you have a presentation for the uh, for the speakers. Also, uh, the first person sharing the, this uh, afternoon and evening uh, will be uh, Sven Bülteris, co-chair uh, of Hills and many other things. And the uh, uh, second person to share today will be Jean. Uh, Will be, will be, help me, uh, Ilya. Sorry, uh, Jean, or not? No, sorry. Will be uh, Walter Compton, uh, a very active uh, longevist uh, since many years, uh, and among others, member of the International Longevity Alliance. The presentation of the speakers uh, will be made by Shivani and will be uh, in the chat. And in the chat, you are, of course, more than welcome to ask uh, your questions, but you can also ask your questions after uh, each talk and also normally during uh, a question time at the end of uh, each session. Please, uh, if you want to ask a question, raise your virtual hand. It's in uh, normally in uh, reactions, I think in, Engl in English then you can raise your hand there, or you can raise your hand physically. Okay, so this is for the general presentation for this, uh, well, uh, afternoon and evening for Europe, uh, and uh, morning and beginning of the afternoon for the a big part of the USA. So now I give the word to uh, Sven, who will uh, chair, like I said, uh, the first uh, part of the uh, conference, the second day of the conference. Sven. Okay, thank you, Didier, and uh, welcome everyone to the conference. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of today, which is the, Dr. Ilya Stambler. Uh, Dr. Stambler is the Chief Science Officer and Chairman of VTEC, which is the Seniori Seniority Association and the Movement for Longevity and Quality of Life. He's also a board member of ILIA. ILIA. Um, so welcome, uh, Dr. Sambler. Thank you very much, Sven. Thank you very much, Didier. Uh, once again, uh, thanks for organizing this event and uh, really happy to be here. Today's focus, um, the focus of today is uh, data sharing and uh, advocacy. And I, in, my, uh, in my talk, I'll try to combine both topics uh, basically, we all know our main premise, our main idea of geroscience or longevity medicine or anti-aging, whatever you prefer to call it, is that by intervention into aging, we will be able to postpone multiple age-related diseases, 
Why? Simply because aging is the main risk factor or the main cause or even a, an illness of itself. But if we're able to uh, intervene into aging, we'll also be able uh, to extend our health life. That's what we advocate, that's what we research, that's what we want to accomplish. And this idea should be clear to everybody uh, in this period of COVID. We see that all the people are the most affected uh, by this, uh, by this uh, crisis with the highest mortality, uh, with the highest severity of disease. Uh, so the logical step would be to understand that if we really want to fight COVID as well, we also want to improve the underlying health of all the people to intervene into the aging process. And we advocated a lot for this idea uh, in online conferences, in position papers, in research papers, in the press. Uh, we went to the governments. Uh, unfortunately, this idea wasn't widely accepted. People seem, still uh, consider uh, the virus separately from the risk factors. Um, so um, if we thought that uh, COVID would actually promote the research of aging, unfortunately, it didn't happen uh, as far as I can uh, see. Uh, on the contrary, often you would go to a decision maker uh, to talk about um, health of all the people and then they would say, uh, no, we are uh, busy with COVID, sorry. So now hopefully the COVID is subsiding so we can um, actually return to, to direct advocacy for aging health. Um, and uh, this, uh, this idea that uh, aging health is important for infectious disease will be relevant, uh, if not for this, uh, for the next uh, health crisis that will affect all the people. And I would argue that it is because um, aging wasn't addressed sufficiently during this crisis that we also didn't do so well uh, in coping with COVID. We see that uh, uh, life expectancy declined globally by almost two years. That's, that should scare us all. Uh, that's the first major decline in life expectancy in the 70 years uh, after the Second World War. Uh, almost 10 years of um, uh, progress was lost. Uh, in some countries, it's, it's really scary, like in Russia and in Bulgaria, or Mexico, four years of decline. In uh, most uh, Western and most European countries, it's less, uh, about a year. Also in Israel, uh, the most decline was in the developing low-income countries. Still, this should scare us a lot. Uh, all our medical technologies weren't able to stop this, uh, this trend. So for us, it should just give motivation to advocate and research and develop more for health and longevity, because this will also be the way to prevent, uh, first of all, to return to the level at least of 2019. There are signs we're already returning, and then to continue our progress. And there's uh, proofs of feasibility that it is possible uh, to intervene into aging, to extend health and longevity. We all know uh, the main, uh, the most popular classifications of the major aging processes, such as strategies for engineering negligible senescence, and after that, they came the hallmarks of aging and the um, pillars of aging of the NIH Geoscience um, uh, interest group. All they have uh, the, the same idea that by intervention to the major aging processes, uh, it will be possible to extend uh, health longevity, prevent diseases, and the proofs of feasibility for all these uh, interventions for all the major aging processes, uh, mainly in animal models, but there are already some uh, human trials that are very promising. Of course, our goal uh, is as not just a scientist, but also as a longevity activist to accelerate the transition to the clinic uh, as fast as possible with as much as possible efficacy and safety, but there is a feasibility of, of, of such intervention. Uh, and still uh, the, the, one of the major problems in this transition uh, is uh, the development of metrics uh, for, uh, for our interventions. We simply cannot treat something that it cannot diagnose and oh, we cannot measure. No science starts with measurements. And if we cannot even define what is exactly what that we want to measure, we cannot advance in our testing and our treatments. And that's uh, quite a problem. There are many, many uh, approaches, uh, things uh, we can measure. Obviously everything changes with age. Everything can be a biomarker of aging. So what is it exactly that uh, we want to measure? Uh, and here the question of data comes to the fore. Um, in order to develop any such metrics, uh, we need a lot of data. We need to, the data to be reliable. We need to be able to, to analyze the data accord, appropriately uh, in order to develop uh, metrics, not just for, uh, for uh, uh, predicting uh, aging health trajectory, but also to test the efficacy and safety of anti-aging treatments. Still, the main idea remains that uh, by intervention into aging, we will be able to extend health and longevity. And I'm happy uh, to say that this idea is already entering the mainstream. As of this year, aging is already included into the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD-11 system, 
not as a disease per se, but as two categories as, um, uh, first of all, as a causality category or etiology, the so-called aging associated, uh, uh, aging related uh, uh, code, uh, and also as a, um, a set of symptoms, general symptoms, in other words, a syndrome, and that is the aging associated decline in intrinsic capacity. So even if it's not called the disease directly, for our purposes, it's even better. That's something that we can address, directly address in a measurable way to tackle aging, to prevent age-related diseases. And that's great. And I'm happy that uh, this was done uh, in, in, um, in a large measure or even mostly because of advocacy, many advocacy efforts uh, that we accomplished during the past 10 years and many uh, key figures actually in this room. Uh, of course, the excellent work of Daria and, and colleagues, uh, but also Sven. Um, and uh, and Victor and um, Alex Shavarenkov and Eduard and Didier, um, uh, the, some initiatives uh, included the the seminal um, uh, topic in frontiers in genetics uh, to uh, to address aging as a disease. Also, I can say that um, uh, uh, we uh, advocated for it already ten years ago in 2012. We, we wrote to Knesset and requested to set an advisory committee to uh, to uh, fight the disease of aging. In those words, I believe it was even the first uh, such outreach at the state level. So a lot of uh, efforts came together and finally we have the results. Aging is in the, the ICD, so we can address aging as a medical condition uh, according to WHO, according to ICD. And of course, Dari will speak about it more, but it's a huge achievement of advocacy, of longevity advocacy, uh, and we can be proud and build on that because as we said, the next steps will be to develop evaluation criteria for aging, the things that we want to measure, um, uh, and here we do need some uh, some consensus, uh, some um, uh, some um, uh, standards for good practices. Uh, we simply cannot um, have the situation that every person, every researcher, has a matrix of aging of his or her own. Uh, it's nice, you know, maybe it helps to develop, but we do need some common language. On the other hand, not to overregulate the field, and uh, not to um, uh, to kill innovation. On the other hand, we do need some uh, scientific basis for our discussion, some common definitions. Uh, so uh, we also advocated a lot uh, for such a consultation uh, for, for years, and uh, now uh, such consultation are, are forthcoming. Hopefully we need more. Uh, and this is not an easy question. How exactly do we define aging? How do we define the metrics of aging right now? We don't even have a common definition of aging in clinical terms. Is it a disease, a syndrome, a polysyndrome, risk factor, underlying cause? Um, do we measure it as frailty or as biological age, multimorbidity? We don't know yet. Uh, hopefully, we'll discuss and and uh, understand better. And there are many factors that come into play here. Uh, I need them to stop. Um, uh, many factors that come into play here. Uh, uh, many evaluation criteria that we need to develop and agree on, such as clarity of definition. Uh, do we address uh, this as a state or the process? Uh, minimization of confounding factor, informative value. And a part of those, we also need to think about utility of those metrics. Actually, if uh, the, uh, the biomarker or a metric is very informative and, and um, uh, very scientifically sound, but it's accessible to 10 people <laughs> in the richest segment of the world, it's no use to, to actually improve public health, the things that we actually um, aim and talk about. So we need to think about standardization, cost effectiveness, affordability. Um, uh, still, we need more uh, discussion, more more um, academic and uh, public discussion around those topics. Uh, and further evaluation criteria were suggested uh, by um, uh, Moskalov's group and uh, also Kennedy, uh, who suggested some primary selection criteria for geoprotectors, secondary selection criteria, uh, such as evolution conservatism of target uh, mechanism. Uh, the primary was increased lifespan. Uh, there is the um, uh, uh, set of evaluation criteria by the American Federation for Aging Research, such as uh, the, bi um, the biomarkers should predict uh, remaining life expectancy. Uh, recently, um, Eric Verdin uh, suggested another set of evaluation criteria, such as uh, reflection of, um, of ubiquitous age-related processes and so forth. Of course, uh, these things are rather far from the clinic. Uh, but still there's some uh, discussion toward uh, some common uh, definitions, some common evaluation criteria. Uh, more to the, uh, closer to the clinic is uh, the, the work done by um, Andrea Meyer and uh, the WHO working group on intrinsic capacity, um, who have been uh, developing uh, some uh, definitions of intrinsic capacity, basically of healthy aging uh, with some, um, uh, some sets of metrics. 
and uh, we actually talked with Andrea yesterday about this a little bit. Um, and it's a great effort in, in the right direction. Uh, still, this is basically a classification of the most popular um, uh, areas of measurement that are currently adopted in the aging field. Uh, what I would hope that the, such metrics would be more based on uh, actual uh, theory of aging. That way it will also be um, easier to convince people to actually use those metrics because every, uh, everybody has uh, their own uh, equipment and they simply cannot measure anything outside of it. So if we have some uh, truly scientifically grounded uh, uh, basis for those metrics, such as uh, even the theories we had in the 60s, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Strayl Midland theory of, uh, of uh, exponential, uh, you know, exponential um, loss of function uh, due to, uh, uh, to linear uh, loss of function, uh, sorry, exponential loss of uh, regulation due to increase, uh, uh, linear loss of function or uh, the, um, uh, the Sims theory of uh, the uh, autocatalytic accumulation of damage. If our metrics were based even on this kind of theory, I think it would be more readily accepted. But uh, right now we mostly have uh, some, some classification of the popular things we want to measure. Um, but hopefully there'll be more uh, theoretical justification for that. Uh, still, uh, uh, the most practical way so far remains uh, the, the approach proposed by Nir Barzilai, uh, which basically said, if we don't know how to measure aging, how to diagnose aging, at least we can uh, uh, diagnose and measure uh, some of the known disease. So let's measure that and combine and see how um, uh, the emergence is postponed with intervention. Um, as we know, uh, this, uh, this approach was approved by the FDA in 2015 after seven years this study didn't start yet uh, for various reasons, uh, but at least conceptually, I personally believe that's the most practical approach so far until we develop uh, real metrics of aging. Um, and here in Israel, we also use this approach. For example, uh, we put it in the Virex aging um, uh, call for proposals that I had to, um, uh, the honor to, to, to write. Uh, for example, seeking new approaches to, to uh, diagnose uh, uh, multimorbidity as a proxy for aging. Um, uh, we also do our part uh, with my colleague David Bloch. Uh, we try to develop some metrics of aging based on information theoretical measures such as uh, normalized mutual information um, and, uh, and entropy. Uh, such metric has some advantages. For example, they allow to measure the cumulative synergistic effects um, of, um, of, uh, uh, of treatments also. Uh, also, they allow to establish nonlinear correlations. Also, they allow uh, uh, non-dimensional measurements, basically for for any system. So a lot of um, a lot of advantages. So we published some papers, even in the high impact journals. Unfortunately, it wasn't uh, very widely accepted. But at least you know that's our drop in the ocean. I hope uh, more uh, drops like this com combine into mighty stream to define a, a workable um, a workable uh, uh, science based metrics of aging. Uh, I live in Israel, so Israel can be very helpful in this in this effort. Uh, here in Israel, uh, we have um, uh, electronic health records since the 80s for 40 years. No other country has it, so we're able to uh, to have uh, some uh, uh, good uh, good metrics uh, of longitudinal, not just comparing all the people with younger people who maybe had some different life courses, so not um, uh, necessarily comparable. Uh, but also we can uh, see self-referentially how uh, uh, certain uh, populations developed with time. And there was a, a governmental program in Israel to actually make those data more accessible. Uh, and I'll tell you more than this, there was actually a, a plan of the Ministry of Health to, um, to start a registry on aging, where also uh, was involved already in 2016. And uh, where are those programs? Uh, in the same place that uh, many programs are during the COVID times. But hopefully uh, they can be revived and 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 you know and, and um, uh, we can uh, uh, get back to those uh, to those um, projects programs and and actually make the data more available and useful for aging research. <clears throat> and I personally believe that also uh, one of the uh, probably the most um, uh, effective way to develop uh, metrics of aging and actually um, have the science base the data is to, to actually do the anti-aging testing. And I was happy to be involved in a study at the beginning of COVID in, uh, in uh, February 2020. We published a paper that was the first paper uh, that, that tried to use mesenchymal stem cells uh, uh, against COVID, showed some good results, and how this connected with aging. Um, the, we know that mesenchymal cell cells are uh, some of the more uh, promising candidates uh, uh, 
uh, to ameliorate uh, immunosenescence. So the idea was that maybe it can also reduce the severe outcome of COVID. Uh, and indeed, uh, there were some good results. Unfortunately, once again, this idea, this approach wasn't widely accepted. Um, uh, obviously, uh, the same approach can be used uh, with other potential anti-aging uh, means like melatonin and metformin and rapamycin. Which, uh, no uh, uh, wide-scale clinical trials, this kind was done during this entire period. Uh, but, you know, the rationale is sound and hopefully uh, uh, will continue to advance uh, later on in common times. And as activists, I still uh, have a couple more minutes. Uh, you know, we're activists, I do some research. I have over 60 academic papers, but uh, I'm, I'm mostly an activist. I'm involved in various organizations uh, like International Longevity Alliance and International Society on Aging and Disease. Here in Israel, we have our VETEC uh, Seniority Association, the Movement for Longevity. And we try to advance all those agendas because we understand we may have the most uh, science-based, uh, evidence-based uh, metrics for aging, uh, but um, if uh, the decision makers don't accept them, uh, they will be useless. They will not be able to develop therapies, will not be able to implement therapies. So we actually need to work with decision makers, first of all, to even explain to them that the aging is important you know, as a social issue, as a health issue. Uh, they don't get it still. After, after uh, almost 20 years, they advocate for it. They, many people still don't get it. Uh, and uh, then we need to explain that the the entire um, uh, the entire um, uh, superstructure. You know, the need to develop metrics, the need for data, the need to share data. And uh, we had some progress, especially in 2019. We were able to include um, uh, the topic of health and longevity research, development, and education into the Israel Master Plan on Aging that was published by Knesset in 2019. And it had uh, three main points. Uh, one is increasing funding for the, for the aging field. Uh, second is uh, improving education for the field. And third, and it's crucial, is uh, to uh, develop metrics for preventive intervention into age-related diseases and to use them in uh, public health. So it's uh, written very nicely on paper in this uh, report of, of Knesset, even said that, that it's um, the initiative of VETEC. And still, uh, after three years of COVID, it didn't uh, go far, but, you know, and we also didn't have a stable government, by the way, so basically no one to talk with. But now, you know, we're with the new government, we hope to renew this discussion and hope uh, to actually move this uh, uh, from paper to some actual, uh, some actual implementation, because there were already some, um, uh, some uh, practical results from this advocacy, um, uh, thanks uh, to this and to some early initiatives. Uh, we were able to um, encourage some call for research proposals. One is Biorex Aging that I mentioned, uh, others by the Ministry of, of Science on Healthy Aging. Uh, so altogether, I believe our advocacy helped to bring about uh, $20 million for the field um, in Israel and international collaboration with Israel. So maybe by some standards, not a lot, but you know, for us, it's a good boost. And I hope uh, we'll accomplish more. Of course, this issue can be uh, scaled up to any dimensions. Uh, uh, we, we talk about Israel, but of course, Israel can form collaboration with any country and also uh, any two countries or any several countries from, can form collaboration uh, to, um, to collect data on aging, to, to share data on aging, to develop analytics of aging. And I uh, hope uh, we continue to be involved in this and I hope uh, this field will develop and I think my time is up. Thank you. Any questions, I guess, if you have. Okay, thank you, uh, Ilya, for this amazing lecture. Um, so are there any questions? I didn't see any in the chat at the moment. Oh, did you? Yeah, <clears throat> if nobody has questions, I have one. Uh, um, oh, um, Ilya, uh, what do you know about uh, sharing of health data in, can you tell a little bit more about sharing of health data for the citizens uh, in your country? Because you know uh, that in Europe, in most countries now, uh, well, in many countries now, but not in all countries, theoretically, uh, all citizens have uh, access to their own uh, health data and uh, whatever the, the clinical, the, 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 the clinic, the medical doctor, is it already uh, such a situation in Israel or it's a project or can you tell a little bit uh, more? And of course, uh, the, the next question is, but I, I, I'm afraid the answer is negative, but still, is it possible to share with uh, scientists? Eh, well, in Belgium, it's not yet possible. 
Yes, yes, a great question. Sorry, I didn't have enough time to, to address it. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Israel has a lot of great medical data. For 40 years, uh, more than 40 years, we have electronic health records, uh, so tons of data. Uh, but those uh, data are concentrated in uh, so-called the health um, uh, management organizations, HMOs, uh, and they keep the data because yeah, they publish. You know, they they, they want to uh, to develop uh, themselves, and you know, sharing is not so easy. But there are plans, yeah, to to make a common database under the direction of the Ministry of Health. And as I told you, there is already a plan in 2016 to, to, um, uh, to um, have a special uh, registry on aging, uh, you know, uh, aging related phenomena uh, that would include the data, data from HMOs and uh, also governmental hospitals and, and clinics and, and, uh, and, and other facilities. Uh, so there was wonderful plans. Uh, there were plans, you know, to, to make them more accessible to researchers. Unfortunately, I don't see them, you know, so, some implementation is being on, on the way, but I don't think uh, great many results because uh, as uh, we see, uh, the the people who own data hold to them, they prefer, you know, to, to build uh, on themselves. On the other hand, uh, we also need to understand that, you know, if people um, invested uh, time and effort into um, creating data, they, they just don't throw it around. Uh, you don't... Uh, yeah, all those all those uh, ideas are great about about uh, sharing, but you know, if you if you work for something, you don't give away all your all your money, all the possessions. So all those uh, uh, reasonings are there. Uh, that's why there there is no such uh, uh, great uh, great sharing and and great access. Uh, but still, uh, the data is there and the research is there. So hopefully, there'll be more um, uh, more uh, uh, development, especially in in relation to it. So that's as much as I can say um, at this point. And of course, uh, we, we see all those initiatives, even our initiative, uh, which already included uh, the, the question of metrics of data access. But once again, it's still on paper. Uh, hopefully, it will, it will uh, you know, uh, uh, materialize. OK, thank you. Uh, no more questions. Oh, Martin has one. Yeah, so my question is, um, Ilya, do you see activist organizations as some kind of uh, catalysators um, for uh, finding consensus about biomarkers that we should bring together as scientists? Yes, definitely. First of all, I see activists as, as catalyzers for, for the entire aging field. You know, uh, some people uh, prefer to to, uh, to actually deal with, uh, with uh, commercial startups and, you know, with the promise of a uh, drug uh, in five years. I, I think and I believe that uh, that also uh, non-profit advocacy organizations are very important to advance the field. And case in point, our um, uh, uh, association in Israel uh, with almost zero investment from anybody, basically from our volunteering activity, we brought uh, millions to the field and also uh, you know, help to change the, the public agenda uh, to bring more interest to the aging field. And that also includes uh, the, the, um, the issue of, of biomarkers. Of course, as activists, we cannot just you know, force uh, uh, scientists to accept uh, the evidence, you know, uh, it's actually dangerous. It's actually the danger that uh, there will be a political influence of, of those markers that will be biased for certain special interests. Uh, so we can't uh, get uh, too, uh, too involved in the politics, but at least we can bring attention uh, to the subjects. And here I believe um, advocacy activism is very important. Okay, no more questions. Good, then we move to the next speaker. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Liz Parish. Is she, uh, can she share her screen? Liz, you you okay, yeah. So um, Liz Parish is the founder and CEO of BioViva. Uh, she is a humanitarian, an entrepreneur, an innovator, an author, a podcaster, and a leading voice for genetic cures. And if I can say it myself, I think her positivity and her enthusiasm for this field is very infectious. So I give the floor now to Liz Parish. <coughs> Liz, you've got the wrong kind of full screen. Did that one work? Perfect. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> I can't tell on my side. 
So um, hi, I'm here to talk about BioViva and what we're doing in the gene therapy space. So we are committed to treating biological aging with gene therapy. And um, recently we've had uh, more advancements in our gene therapy delivery method uh, because our focus is larger payloads uh, for lower doses. We're pretty um, sure that treating biological aging is going to take more than one gene. And so we want to get that into one delivery method for you. So here uh, we're looking at lifespan and health span. And as most people on this call know, uh, we spend far too much time in ill health. So we're hoping that regenerative medicine will not only help us extend health span, but lifespan as well. We are pretty interested in doing more than squaring the curve. Squaring the curve is kind of morbid. You live really healthy and then you drop off. But of course, we're hoping that regenerative medicine will take you along much further than that. But the importance of this is that we spend a lot of time in ill health, as I had already said. And, you know, when we start to get... Uh, I don't know, we start to get time to actually take vacations and do the things that we want in life, we have a real diminishing return on health. And you can see that here in this curve. We are less healthy and less able to do the things we like to do as we get older. And that's quite unfortunate. Of course, uh, aging as is at the core of that. I personally believe that aging is a disease. It's the master disease that causes the symptoms of things like cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and uh, a myriad of organ failures and diminishing health. So I believe that every civilized society in this day and age should be working to cure biological aging. For those of you that are interested in what's happening in gene therapy globally, there are a myriad of approvals. So gene therapy has proven itself through the best proof of concept, something called monogenic disease. So people who are born with congenital disorders, a single gene mutation, are now seeing curative effects through gene therapy. And in some of the cases, these may be one treatment for a lifetime or only two or three. And that's pretty amazing. So that was a great proof of concept space for gene therapy to show us that this, in fact, was the route to go. With BioViva, of course, we're interested in complex disorders. So treating complex disorders like aging is going to be more difficult. It won't be a one and done gene therapy. Um, and how we know this is we have some uh, work in the space. We started in AAV, which is adeno-associated virus. And that's a, a very small uh, viral vector that can get genes into cells. Now, when we talk about gene therapy and viral vectors, these are not viruses that will get you sick. Their ability to deliver their own genetic payload has been removed. And now what they do is they deliver therapeutic payloads. So they deliver genes that make you healthier. And uh, we have two peer-reviewed papers in this space. Uh, the first one is around my gene therapy. So in 2015, I took two gene therapies to treat biological aging. Uh, one of them was called telomerase reverse transcriptase. And it, of all the genes that we look at, targets the most hallmarks of aging. And the hallmarks of aging are sort of our uh, company's uh, targets for reversing biological aging. It gives us a biomarker uh, to look at of whether or not we have had an effect on the cell. And so with telomerase reverse transcriptase, we do things like lengthen telomeres. They also have a lot of off-target uh, moonlighting that seems to happen in the cells with the uh, advent of the upregulation of telomerase reverse transcriptase. And those things we're learning over time. And they all seem to be so far uh, beneficial uh, to uh, aging associated diseases. So we uh, published this paper last year. This was all just about my telomere work. Um, one doctor had a specific interest in the telomere specific work. We hope to come out with a paper with all of the uh, results of everything. I've, I can tell you that there hasn't been any negative data in my work, but a lot of it is blood work, which is, you know, um, 
Some doctors like to look at that and some doctors don't because it's actually quite a lot of data. But anyway, what we can see is from 2015, from my first gene therapy to my last in 2020, we ha I have had an increase in my telomere length. And so one of the things that we hope that that will help with is things like cellular senescent with uh, communicable diseases, things like COVID, it might be able to help a lot of people. But uh, telomerase has a lot of other benefits to the cells that we'll talk about in a later study. Another thing that we did is we are definitely a huge proponent of getting drugs into humans as fast as possible for the ethical use of these technologies. In 2020, we were part of a study that was done on five patients for dementia. This was a study of telomerase reverse transcriptase and clotho delivered intranasally, again, to five patients. And let's look a little bit at, about these gene candidates more in depth so you understand why we use these in dementia. So telomerase reverse transcriptase has a, a tenacious ability to repair telomeres, something that get degraded and shorter as we age. It seems to have a, a wonderful effect on mitochondrial health, which is something that is failing in an aging population. It improves genomic stability. And of course, we hope that in the future, we'll be able to show that this may actually stave off things like cancer and aging people. It reduces senescent cells. But in research in other peer-reviewed papers, we saw that it also reduced tau tangles. And so this made it an interesting candidate for uh, dementia with, a, with uh, the potential of Alzheimer's. It was associated with reduced plaques and it protects animals against uh, biological aging and animal research. The second gene was clotho. Uh, clotho uh, may improve brain function and cognitive ability. It was found in a research paper upon autopsy, people who appeared to have uh, uh, Alzheimer's upon autopsy, that's when they find that the beta amyloid plaques and the degradation of the the uh, brain, they, people who were upregulators for clotho naturally didn't show the cognitive decline around the disease. So that would be really beneficial. It's also associated with upregulating a couple of genes that are associated with uh, healthy longevity, FGF21 and FGF23. It seems to help clear damage caused by oxidative stress. And it's low when, as you age, clotho levels are lower in your body, and that's associated with chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. So it may have some sort of benefit. After we released our paper, a paper came out that showed that it was also associated with less beta amyloid plaques. So that was pretty cool. And again, this is another extender of model organisms lifespan. So what did we see in the dementia study? We saw improved cognitive scores, and we saw lengthened telomeres and the shortest telomeres in the, uh, the T lymphocytes. And that was kind of uh, surprising. We didn't think that we, we had done a very low uh, dose of gene therapy, which might point to that the, a low dose could be beneficial in an aged population for uh, immune senescence. But uh, we didn't even think that we needed to look at telomeres because it was such a low dose delivered intranasally, but we decided to do it and we were very glad we did. The Fulstein testing scores were the biggest excitement around this uh, treatment. It did not seem to be a cure for most persons, although one person went from assisted living and is still living on their own two years later. And that's pretty excited. Citing out of the five patients, one patient seemed to have uh, no benefit at all. So um, just a little plug, we're raising money to do another study, and we want to increase the dose uh, to see if we can get a better effect in the gene therapy. <clears throat> and we'll actually have two arms, one with the two gene therapies and one with three gene therapies. We have another target. <clears throat> Our company has been working for several years um, on creating a better platform for gene therapy. So when we looked at the gene therapy space and participated in it, <clears throat> we found that the problem really with gene therapy and complex disorders like aging is that today's most commonly used viral vector is too small to treat complex disorders. If 
For instance, in 2020, I decided to try four different genes associated with treating biological aging. And to take those four genes, I had to take four different therapeutics. Uh, there are known toxic uh, doses of that gene therapy. And so we have to be very careful that we stay within certain parameters. And it's just vastly inefficient. My goal was to get all of these into one vector so we could predictively deliver gene therapy at a lower doses. So we went back to the drawing board and we started working with a vector called cytomegalovirus. This is a tenacious uh, virus that all, almost all of the population already has. Uh, it has its own genes to run under the immune system so that uh, it can uh, essentially be very persistent. It has it doesn't have much of a negative effect on the body unless you are on immune suppressants or you are very elderly. Of course, we are not getting you sick <clears throat> with the virus. We are using the viral capsid to deliver healthy therapeutic genes. So it really met what we needed to deliver large <clears throat> payloads and uh, do it under the radar of the immune system. And we wanted to test things like redosing. We wanted to test and see if we could actually give this intranasally and have a persistent uh, upregulation of the genes as we might want to see in the perfect gene therapy delivery method. <clears throat> so in 2022, we released a three years <laughs> in the in the making uh, paper uh, that was associated with what happened with this vector in mouse model. We use two genes. One of them is called folostatin. It uh, increases muscle mass by blocking something called myostatin. It improves nutrient sensing. It seems to combat against metabolic uh, disorder. Uh, and I'll show you some of the data around that later. And um, this could be a very beneficial gene for an aging population who are suffering with frailty. It also is an extender of lifespan in model organisms. The second gene we used is one that I've already talked about. It's telomerase reverse transcriptase. And uh, we chose these two genes because they already have a good deal of information on them. And it was important for us to see if the delivery method was working. And so, you know, this is this is uh, was the focus of these two arms. These genes were not given together. They were given separately. So there was a control group, a group that only got the viral vector, and then the two arms of the telomerase group, one intranasally, uh, one intraperitonally, and then two arms of the folostatin group, again, separate, one intranasally and one interperitonally. And so we treated these mice when they were about the equivalent age of 57, 56, 57 in human years. We wanted to do wild type mice so that we could see the, the biggest benefit. And, and this is what we saw. In the telomerase reverse transcriptase mice, we got a maximum lifespan gain of 41%. And in the folostatin group, we got a 32.5% gain in lifespan. And the best thing about this is was the power of the technology. Not one of the treated mice died within the time of the controls. And that's really important. Um, George Church is one of our advisors. And I had asked him if this was a large enough study. And he said, yeah, it's based on the impact of the therapeutic. And we definitely um, saw that impact. So uh, in body mass, the telomerase uh, reverse transcriptase mice maintained their body mass longer. The folostatin mice were definitely much bigger, 33% bigger in, in muscle mass. Uh, task performance, the task performance of the chert mice was over five times uh, faster than the controls and the folostatin mice three times faster. So this points to, um, you know, maintaining body mass and better cognition. The glucose tolerance was um, 
must substantially better in both groups. Uh, telomerase in all groups performed better than folostatin. Glycated hemoglobin was definitely lower, the, the best again in, in the telomerase group. So what was uh, improved uh, overall was uh, fur. Visually, both groups had much better fur. Um, the telomerase reverse tra transcriptase group, when the controls were dying, you can see the controls in the upper right-hand corner, the telomerase group in the mid uh, area, and folostatin in the lower uh, right-hand corner. Uh, the telomerase group, the uh, vets thought that they were eight month old mice. And that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, mitochondria, we tested mitochondria. It was better in both treated groups. Uh, muscle mass, of course, was much improved in the folostatin group. Activity was higher and there was no increased risk of cancer in our treated mice. Let's see, let's go to the next one. So um, what could this mean if things translated directly to humans, which, um, you know, this is my, my, my whole life's work will be translating medicine to humans because it's the most important. And I don't think that mice are highly predictive of outcome in humans. Uh, let's hope that humans even do better than this. <laughs> So we started treatment when the mice were 18 months old, and that would be around that 56, 57 in human uh, years. If you were going to live an average lifespan in the U.S. to about, let's say, 78, um, if you took folostatin, you might live to be 100 years old. And if you took the telomerase reverse transcriptase, you might live to be over a supercentenarian. And that's pretty exciting. Again, one uh, hallmark of this study was that we did redosing. And that is um, could be very important uh, for especially things like neurodegeneration and uh, chronic conditions that are harder to get on top of. So it's not enough just to have the technology. People definitely need to use it. And um, I cannot state that enough. I, I'm certainly um, probably the biggest proponent for the bioethical debate of using uh, technology and de-risking it through human use, not animal use. One of the projects that we have done in order to keep the uh, population abreast of what's happening in gene therapy is something called the Code Keeper. Uh, please visit it. It's bioviva-codekeeper.com. It gives people the ability to look up their conditions, see what's happening in gene therapy, and it has a subscription model for people who are engineering gene therapies or medical doctors to actually uh, pull the sequences, the promoters, and more. So um, this is a great place to go if you have a child with a disease, if you're suffering with a disease, and you're interested in what's happening in this space, maybe you can find a lab to fund. Maybe you can spin out a company and license some of this technology. I'm a huge proponent that we need more people in this space driving this technology forward. I wanna thank our team uh, that have been amazing and um, are trying to help to streamline our preclinical work towards uh, human clinical trials. Uh, we're very excited about that. And um, we hope that it's a big success. If I have a couple more minutes, I want to talk briefly about best choice medicine, a humane route to drug uh, delivery. Again, I think the most important thing that we can do is to get human data, and there are humans who are dying. Today, while we're having this presentation and this nice uh, conversation about treating biological aging, over 100,000 people will die of these diseases, and we really need to call out and make sure that the uh, regulatory systems are held accountable to these deaths, that risk aversion isn't responsible for more deaths today than than we could save. Uh, last year, or this year, rather, uh, Bill Andrews and I put out a paper uh, that is suggesting this route uh, for uh, non-communicable uh, aging-associated disease burden. And I think that it's uh, very important that the discussion starts now. I do believe that we have the technology to already help people live longer and healthier and get them to the next stage where we have 
therapies that actually cure aging. This platform gives multitude of companies the ability to work together to bring their data together if they choose to. We hope that they do to cure aging. We do not believe that one modality on its own will cure all of biological aging. We think that the um, industry needs to bring these uh, drug candidates. We need to identify them. We need to get them into an informational database. We need review boards to look at them and to um, approve or push them forward towards uh, human access. Upon patient access, we need these drug, uh, the drug discovery information reshared with the system. We need good drugs to go into clinical trials and get to the masses and bad drugs to leave the system. Uh, we need to do this because uh, we need people to get access to these medicines earlier in technological advancement than they already are. Um, uh, the, the, all of the genes that BioViva works with, we work with about seven genes now have meta-analysis. They've been around for over a decade. They've extended animal lifespan and, and translating them to human has just been too slow and too difficult. And that is really disappointing. We owe it to our children to leave this world a better place than we found it. And we have the opportunity to maybe stay here a very long time, enriching the future with the information that we have garnered over a lifetime and making the world a better place. So with that, I wanna thank you. I hope that you live long and well, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Okay. We already have some questions. Uh, let me start with the first one. Uh, Walter Compton in the chat asks, amazing results. What are the prospects for accessibility of gene therapy, uh, specifically regarding the cost of the treatment? Yeah, so the, the great thing about treating biological aging. So again, I think two days ago, we just had another story come out in the media that hemophilia now has a treatment through gene therapy, but it is now the most expensive gene therapy on the planet. Every gene therapy that seems to be launched for monogenic disease, one by one becomes the most expensive uh, drug on the planet. But the great thing about biological aging is we can actually scale it. So um, when we're, when, if we use genes that have shared proteins, um, things unlike telomerase reverse transcriptase that we seem to need to get into every cell, but things like folostatin and clotho and PGC1-alpha and FGF21, these type of genes, they actually, we don't have to do a large dose of gene therapy. We could do a gene therapy localized in one part of your body and the proteins will share to your entire body. And that has been uh, really the focus of, of George Church trying to find, you know, these genes in which you would take a much lower dose, much like an immunization, immunization against aging. Then we work with those genes uh, here at BioViva, and we also work with genes that are a little bit more difficult in which we need to get into most cells of the body. And that makes a more expensive gene therapy because it's a higher dose. Again, these are not live vectors. So the, the dose that we administer is the dose you get. They don't replicate. Um, I do believe that these will be uh, massively affordable, especially compared to the cost of aging, and that this could be done um, with uh, sufficient funding and su sufficient backing by the regulatory su system and uh, large, large uh, companies. Okay. Jose also had a question. Uh, yes. Hello, Liz. Uh, always great to see uh, you and uh, your presentation. I have two quick questions. Number one, how do you track the impact of different gene therapies if you are combining them? And second, uh, a friend of mine just went to a mini circle in Roatan, Honduras for a folistatin therapy. How does that compare to, to yours? Do, do you know? Yeah, so uh, that's great. I'll, I'll handle the second one first. So with MiniCircle, they're doing uh, plasmids. And so they have a temporary effect on the body. Uh, they'll last for some amount of time. With gene therapy, you're actually getting a persistent, uh, probably 10, 20 year um, 
uh, persistence of the, the gene and the protein. So uh, I think that it's great. We've had a lot of people reach out to us who are part of that study who say that if they like the effects, they're going to go to medical tourism uh, to participate in um, the, the gene therapy for the persistent uh, effect of the gene. And um, so when we're looking at uh, gene therapy, so to, uh, to be clear, we our company cannot give uh, gene therapies to patients, uh, unfortunately, because we're a U.S. company, we have to work within the, the regulatory system of the United States. But what we can do is assess data of medical tourism. So since, the, since my information came out and more information came out around gene therapies and longevity and the potential uh, benefits of these, uh, different medical tourism companies have popped up to offer these technologies, which is, which actually shows our regulatory system that there is a push that, you know, the, the pot is boiling over. And if people don't have access to technologies, they will leave the country to go get them. So um, that's my best choice. Medicine is, is a plan is to try to, to bring within the regulatory zones, the bigger countries of the world and an ethical platform for this pre-testing of these drugs so that the FDA uh, gets human data rather than mouse data going in and they'll have a much more likely success. So when we look at medical tourism data, so, you know, there would be some companies out there and if you guys are connected to them who might not track data, please put them in touch with us. We think that it's an imperative to create um, evidence-based medicine, even off of medical tourism. And so when we're looking at a gene therapy um, and people going through gene therapy process, we're looking at several things. Number one, a lot of pre-testing has to be done, a lot of baseline. There, this often is MRI images or FMRI, MRI if it has to do with dementia. This has to do with uh, maybe if it's associated with telomere lengths, a lot of telomere testing, uh, blood work, and then anything, if they're treating a specific disease, we need all of the disease specific uh, biomarkers. And then after they go through the gene therapy, then we would test them uh, a myriad of times, three, six, uh, nine, and 12 months. And then we follow them for years doing testing over years. So we want to see if the, the gene therapies are persistent, if they've had an effect, things like epigenetic age, uh, microbiome, telomere length, and then uh, the regular associated uh, blood and imaging. So this um, is something that we're very committed to again, and I think that it's important. So you're, you're, there was actually two parts to your first question, and, and it was, how would you know that multiple genes are working? So that is, um, that is actually a really interesting uh, zone of understanding because the, we're really at the beginning of that. So right now uh, with BioViva, we're doing our human cell testing. So we test one gene uh, at a time, and then you know we see the little uh, benefit of that single gene, and then we're trying to get the super monster wave. You know, have you ever done that with a with a speaker where you you add all of this sound, and then you try to get a super wave, and and of course that's where we would look to really strongly affect aging. So what we can do right now in human cells when we do combinatorial gene therapies is we can see that each of the proteins, we want to make sure that the proteins were upregulated in the cells. And then we want to see how well they live. And then of course, you know, we have to go to animal models and uh, humans. So, you know, it, it, it will take time. Uh, the most important thing is what happens in a human. And so that's why it's most important that we do the ethical use of these technologies in the humans who need them most, and then watch them over time. So we could do a bunch of fabulous things in a mouse and, <laughs> and, and it may never translate, or it, like I said, it may be better. So, you know, uh, human data is most important. Okay, our next speaker, uh, Aubrey, has a very quick question, but let's keep it quick because we're already four minutes over time. Yeah, right. You don't really have a choice, do you? Because I'm the next speaker anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, yeah, it's not actually a question so much as I wanted to bring the group's attention to a paper that came out yesterday, which is very relevant to Liz's talk. Um, and I've put the link to it in the chat. I'm feeling fairly smug about it because it is the implementation of an idea that I put forward first about eight years ago, 
um, and that we did a little bit of work on in Sense Research Foundation. Essentially, uh, as Liz very correctly mentioned, CMV has some advantages over AAV in terms of both uh, cargo size and immunogenicity. Uh, but we'd like to go further in both of those regards. And this technology does exactly that. The idea is basically to overcome the limitation of CRISPR in terms of um, its um, ability to insert DNA, uh, but to take advantage of the ability of the of what CRISPR has in terms of the location within the genome that it interferes with, which is of course something that's quite important in gene therapy because we don't want to have any where well, we want to minimise the risk of random integration of any um, uh, structure uh, which might um, have oncogenic effects. So the idea is to do it in two steps, to use CRISPR to insert what's called a landing pad for a completely different system called an integrase, uh, which can insert basically anything you like. And um, it's got the potential, which appears, I haven't seen the full text yet, to be had to have been realized in this study. Uh, it's got the potential to insert up to, you know, tens of KB, maybe up to 50 KB into the genome all in one go and to insert it in a chosen location. So I'm really pretty happy about this. It's a very exciting study and I encourage everybody to have a look at it. Uh, that's it. I didn't have a question. That's great. So in comparison to CMV, um, CMV also can do 50 KB. And then our focus is kind of the opposite. We're looking to create an episome. So we don't want to um, edit the human genome. Uh, we're not using CRISPR with our technology, although we could. Uh, we could deliver that 50 KB of, of uh, CRISPR technology. But the, the beauty of the episome is not uh, disrupting the human chromosome and, and not risking the integrational mutagenesis that, that has been found in some of the lentiviruses. So that is awesome. That gives me some reading today. Thank you, Aubrey. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, Aubrey, by the way, um, if you need the full text, I can send you that article if you need it. Rock and roll, please do that. Okay, good. Uh, so, the next speaker is Aubrey, as I already mentioned. He's a biomedical gerontologist who is based in Silicon Valley in California, USA, and he's the president and chief science officer of the new uh, LEV Foundation, uh, which is focused on biomedical research and advocacy for uh, repairing the molecular and cellular damage of aging. I give the word to Aubrey. Uh, thanks very much, Sven. Yeah, so um, uh, Didier asked me to speak about specifically the advocacy initiatives of LEV Foundation. Of course, we are, as Sven mentioned, also doing a bunch of research. Um, so that's what I'll do over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, and let me make the thing actually worked. There we go. But first of all, just let me uh, highlight the wonderful people that I've been able to recruit as the founding team um, at LEVF. These are people that many of you already know, and you will increasingly know them as time goes on, but I won't spend any time on that right now. Um, the directors are also a bunch of absolutely stellar people, including the next two speakers, Daria and Martin. Um, and again, most of you know these people, and those of you who don't will be meeting them over the next month, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, but in terms of advocacy and education, which kind of are very closely linked things, of course, as many of you know, um, my uh, work in this area has very highly um, uh, highlighted the uh, role of conferences. And I believe that that's going to continue, that the conferences which happen in this space, whether it's EHA or RADVEST or whatever, are absolutely fundamental in um, taking this community forward and in growing this community. And of course, um, as I would say, I, I think that my own conferences are the best of all um, because of the, uh, I don't know, the diversity and the uh, emphasis on recreational, the recreational components, things like that. So of course, we had a conference in um, September in Dublin, which a number of people who are in the audience today attended, and it was a blowout success. And I'm uh, delighted to say that the next conference will happen in Dublin next September. Uh, the exact date and venue will be uh, publicized very, very soon. Um, we're just finalizing the contract right now. But um, yeah, mark your calendars because it's definitely going to be back. 
Um, so, as I say, I'm not going to talk much about research today. I, talk, I talked about it quite a bit in Dublin and at various other talks that are online. Um, but I would particularly just want to highlight the first one of these, our combination late onset damage repair program. The idea here is to um, achieve robust mass rejuvenation as fast as we possibly can. And um, we believe that we've got a fair chance of doing it in only a few years now. Uh, we are going to be doing it in collaboration with the most successful of Sense Research Foundation's spin-out companies, Icor Therapeutics. Um, I bought a thousand mice last week, um, which is going to be the, um, the substrate for the very first round of this. We're going to be combining four rejuvenation interventions in various different um, combinations and uh, measuring not only longevity, but of course, um, various aspects of health span. We're going to be starting the study at 18 months of age. And this has some similarity to some of the work that other groups are doing, such as the Rejuvenome project at the Buck Institute. But the big difference is that we are doing rejuvenation uh, things, which they are basically not. The um, other groups that are working in this area are focusing on orally available interventions and you know we just don't think that's going to cut it so we're being braver but that's all i'm going to say about research today because i want to get on to the various things that we have been doing and are doing in the advocacy and education arenas and um, i mentioned all of these things in dublin briefly but i'm going to spend a bit more time on each of them uh right now um so first of all less death so um this is something that uh, was a big highlight of what I did uh, under cover of darkness, so to speak, over the past year before uh, LEV Foundation was launched. And it was a retreat that occurred last uh, August, if, if I'm not mistaken, in um, the mountains outside of the Bay Area. And it was an enormous amount of fun, as you can see here, but it was much more than fun. The idea of this retreat was to bring in a whole bunch of newcomers to the field who would um, have, you know, the right kind of dedication and interest in getting involved and who would have various types of expertise, uh, but who would not necessarily know exactly how to make a contribution. They wouldn't know the right people. They wouldn't know there would be things they didn't know. Um, you know, and so this was designed by myself and um, one of my earliest protégés, Mark Hamelinen, um, about a year and a half ago, we had the first idea um, to, to kind of fix that. And Mark ran with it, and it was a blowout success, as measured this way. I think this is probably the most mind-blowing piece of statistics I've, I've ever seen about an event of this nature. If you look at this, then, you know, they did this like, you know, uh, did the event exceed your expectations kind of standard thing. This was a couple of weeks after the event. And as you can see, obviously, this was all very good. 97% of the attendees say, said that the event exceeded their expectations. So that's great. But the thing I really want to highlight is the thing in the red box. Three quarters of the people who came in, of the 50 newcomers to the field, reported after two weeks after the event, they reported tangible outcomes, as you can see here. I mean, that is just like... That is just like completely impossible. That is like science fiction. It's just no way that happens. So, of course, I am overjoyed at the level of success here. And I'm not the only one. I'm um, delighted to say that this event will be repeated. The next iteration of it is happening in mid-January and applications are already open at lessdeath.org. Um, but I'm even more happy to say that I'm not even having to fund it anymore. Uh, because it was so successful that Mark and his team have been able to attract sufficient uh, financial resources from elsewhere that I can focus my resources on other things. So, um, you know, this is just like one of the things I'm most proud of, of the, of the um, activities that I've been involved in over the past year or so. And I very much encourage everyone to look up uh, lessdeath.org and understand what this event is about, and if you fancy attending, uh, possibly, since of course the people here tend to be rather knowledgeable people, if you fancy attending, you might, Mark might want you to be one of the counsellors this time, who does more of the teaching and less of the learning. So uh, yeah, please uh, educate yourself about this. 
Um, then I want to talk about Afro longevity. So uh, these two extraordinary people, uh, Osius from Nigeria, Brenda's from South Africa, uh, have created this thing called Afro longevity, which is a kind of subset of a broader thing across the whole of transhumanism called Taftis. Um, and Afro longevity is all about bringing the whole, uh, educating the, the new continent, um, you know, the African continent about this whole area about what uh, is desirable, about what is being done, about how quickly it might actually uh, uh, come to any kind of fruition, and of course how to bring it to the countries in the world that have the lowest life expectancy today. And I cannot praise these two people too much. They pulled off a fantastic conference in August of this past year, um, which was the inaugural event, the launch event of Afro Longevity. Um, I was delighted to be there. Jose Cordero, who's in the audience today, was also there. And, um, you know, uh, it was just like, it really showed me that these people not only have dedication and determination and everything, but they also are ex exceptionally competent. And so, again, I encourage you to educate yourselves about this initiative and to think about how you might be able to help them to help the, um, the, the, the next billion people from, from a continent that has not had much role to play in this movement so far. All right, so um, the next thing I want to talk about is A4LI, the Alliance for Longevity Initiatives. And this is a US-based and US-centric um, entity, but of course it very much has the potential to have parallels across the world, especially in Western Europe. And it's all about directly lobbying elected representatives, especially those in the national government in Congress. Um, there are various specifics to this that you can see at the bottom of this slide. But the key thing is that Congress has been a very tough nut to crack over the years. An organization called the Alliance for Aging Research has existed for 30 or 40 years trying to get our elected representatives in the US to pay attention to the idea that aging is quite a bad thing, and in particular that it's very, very expensive because money is a language that elected representatives tend to understand. And um, it's been pretty much completely ineffective. And we believe that the reason it's been ineffective, the number one reason, is because politicians fundamentally have decided that, yes, that would be all very well if we could even slightly postpone the health problems of late life, then wonderful, yes, we would save a lot of money and so on. But that aging is like gravity, there is no way that money is going to change it. And therefore, we are not interested in actually spending money to try to change it. Now, of course, as time's gone on and science has progressed, uh, that argument has become increasingly fragile. And we believe, and the A4LI believe, that now is the time when that argument has become so fragile that at least in the eyes of some of our elected representatives, it can actually be consigned to history. And we can actually get those politicians to, um, to advocate for and to vote for the allocation of considerably more money to more government money to the um, concept of postponing the health problems of late life. Of course, the very first talk yesterday from Lada, one of the most exceptional newcomers to the field, I must say, I can't speak too highly of Lada, um, uh, was exactly on this point. And Lada is um, working also with some of the people who are directly lobbying Congress on this. She explained how the goal there is to allocate money to rapid decision making on um, grant applications. And this is very complementary to that. Um, so then, uh, hello, talk to me. There we go. Um, then uh, the final thing I want to highlight in this talk is the Healthspan Action Coalition, which is headed by these six people, especially the top three, the board members. Um, the uh, idea here is to address the general public, and I mean the real general public, not people who have already bought into the idea that aging is a bad thing or that aging is a medical problem or, or that rejuvenation might actually work. You know, the, the people who are still living in the last century where they think, um, you know, aging is like gravity and we just have to manage it and make the best of our lives. 
uh, as we all know, that still constitutes the large majority of the population. And especially it constitutes the very large majority of the elderly population. In the um, US, there is an organization called the AARP, the American Association for Retired Persons, which essentially um, you know, epitomizes this. It uh, is an organization which nominally, ostensibly, is um, focused on benefiting the elderly, but when it comes to the idea that medical intervention might benefit the elderly, they run away very fast. So the Health Span Action Coalition is designed to fix that. And the people here are, you know, if anybody can do it, they can. Bernie Siegel worked in, um, he's a lawyer by training, but he's worked in regenerative medicine for the past 20 years. And in particular, he ran, uh, he's run a conference for the past, I think, 18 years called the World Stem Cell Summit, which is the uh, absolute foremost, worldwide foremost networking event in regenerative medicine. And Melissa King uh, was the founding executive director of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine and was also the leader of the campaign to get the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine refunded a few years ago. Uh, you will all know, I'm sure, that CIRM was funded as a result of a ballot initiative in California. In other words, the general public voted to have their taxpayers' money spent in very serious uh, amounts. It was $3 billion the first time, it was $5 billion the second time, and Melissa did all of that. Um, so these are the kind, and Sabrina Cohen uh, founded and runs one of the most successful medical charities. So we have people here who have the most extraordinary credentials. And all three of them have decided that now what they want to do is actually focus their efforts squarely on longevity and on rejuvenation. So drawing back from the broader focus on regenerative medicine that they had before. The people at the bottom are also absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, these have uh, a variety of different um, talents. Jofi Deva Kumar is my wife, so um, uh, she has plenty of talents. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is an amazing team of people. Uh, we at LEV Foundation are supporting this group financially at a reasonably higher level because we really believe that now is the time when these kinds of people can go out there and make a genuine difference to public attitudes and the public conversation on this. So I will actually, I think I'll just stop there and um, uh, mentioned that, of course, we have a website, um, we have a nice donate page for anybody who's interested in helping us financially, but we also have um, updates there. The, the website is very much under construction because the foundation is very new, uh, but, the, um, but, but of course, that's the place to go if you want more information. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions, of course. Okay, thank you, Aubrey, and uh, thank you for staying within the time slot that was uh, available. Okay, did you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Aubrey. Well, I have uh, many, many questions, but uh, uh, I have many opportunities to ask questions so also, so I will uh, try to be uh, short in my questions, remark, remarks. The, the first one is, uh, well, thanks a lot for this uh, uh, for uh, the less debt uh, initiative, this camp, it is really great. Um, I think it would be also great to organize such an event in uh, in Europe. And uh, well, there was such an event, uh, I think, two or three years ago in uh, in Europe, uh, just before the, the COVID times, uh, um, organized by Open Longevity, um, uh, ERA Gova, uh, I forgot the first name, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, and also at one moment, uh, Miroslav uh, Radman uh, uh, in Croatia was one of the guy who was thinking about this. So yeah, I think we should uh, try to organize something uh, uh, also at the European site. Thank you very much for the information uh, concerning this new, well, this new group of uh, six people. There is already a name of the organization or I, I, it, I, I didn't get it. Healthspan. Maybe action. you can say it immediately. Yeah, Healthspan Action Sorry. Coalition. Um, so okay, website, thank you. Well, website, website healthspanaction.org. Um, yeah, in terms of your first point, um, absolutely. I mean, so, I think, sorry, I. Yeah, I, I, I will say my, 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 
my, my last question and uh, or remark uh, uh, already. So, and concerning the, um, I forgot the name also, the um, Alliance uh, for Longevity Initiatives, uh, of course, like you know, uh, it would be great also uh, to do that in uh, in Europe. There was this uh, European Longevity Initiative, but not any more very, very active. But uh, once again, great. Uh, and thank you also for your answers now. Right. So first of all, with regard to less death and similar things, absolutely. Mark and his team are very much intending to make it global. They definitely plan to do maybe three or four of these events every year, and they will absolutely not all be in California by any means. They will be around the world. As regards A4LI, um, yes, you're quite right. They make sense to do that globally as well. Um, the thing about A4LI is um, you know, the American political system is a little bit unusual in the sense that, um, you know, lobbying and, you know, giving money to politicians is much more of a bigger deal than it is in uh, most of the countries that we all come from. Um, so, you know, the, the, the logic is a little different and the tactics are a bit different, but the overall goal, absolutely right. Okay, uh, Shulsi had the question. Uh, yes, uh, Aubrey, always good to see you. And this is your third foundation after Methuselah Foundation, Sense Research Foundation, LEV Foundation. So um, is this time different? Uh, and what has changed from the first two foundations to this and the acceleration of this uh, progress? Yeah, so I was actually chatting with one of my board members, Pat Nicklin, this morning about this. I think the best way I have to describe it is in concentric circles. You know, there's an audience, the kind of audience that A4LI and HAC are addressing, people who are still not really on board with the idea that aging is even a medical problem at all, right? Um, and then there are people who understand that aging is a medical problem, but they haven't really got the hang of rejuvenation. They're still thinking in terms of supplements and, you know, no, maybe calorie restriction mimetics and so on. These are the kind of people who would donate to, you know, the Buck Institute or, the, or, or to the American Federation for Aging Research. And then there's people who are one step in from uh, further advanced than that. And they get the idea that aging is bad for you, it's a medical problem. And they also get the idea that rejuvenation is the way to go, uh, because they've kind of, you know, they've maybe they didn't get it when I first started saying it, but when the Hallmarks paper came out it, 10 years ago, it kind of, you know, convinced them. And those are the kinds of people who would have been, come, who, who, would, who would donate to Sense Research Foundation, which is, you know, still very much the preeminent uh, pre-existing organization that focuses on damage repair. But what we have at LEV Foundation is kind of uh, the tip of the spear, you know, the, the center of this. People who not only get that rejuvenation is the way to go, but actually they also see that, you know, they, they take that to its logical conclusion. They are comfortable with the idea of longevity escape velocity, with the idea that we can progressively improve these therapies so as to be able to keep the same people youthful as time goes on as they get chronologically older. And of course, this is an idea that I've been putting forward for a very long time. But unlike the general idea of rejuvenation, it is still something that many mainstream people run away from very fast. So it's definitely the area in which, number one, there is still too little going on, you know, far too little. And number two, it's the area in which perhaps, you know, I with my uh, belligerent uh, persona am um, best place to uh, take forward. Okay, and the last question by Patricio. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Unmute myself, of course. I was saying it's so good to see you and you are always still our king. So now, if you can just say something out of the box about this African initiative, because I have been invited here by a uh, television who is devoted only to Africa and I didn't know what to say, so I have postponed the event. Okay. And it, these images you have shown, this enthusiastic, incandescent, and juvenation, I mean, they are young, they are just young. And the point is, how do you, how would you define just without papers, without nature papers, just what you think, the hallmark 
of the African aging problem. What, because you have to make a sort of shift uh, towards the poverty issue, you see, because this has nothing to do. So you have to subtract the poverty issue and try to understand what is the African aging, because they are so young. Okay, so um, I would say a couple of things. The first thing is that Africa is catching up when it comes to aging, catching up with the Western world. Uh, there is not a single country in the whole of the world now, including sub-Saharan Africa, that has a life expectancy lower than 50. That only became true like seven years ago, right? And now it's already up to a minimum of 53 or something like that. So they are catching up fast. Aging is unquestionably the biggest medical problem in Africa, even bigger than malaria or whatever, already. Um, the second thing is that Poverty per se, well, I mean, as we know, the um, in the West, there is a lot of play made of this thing called the longevity dividend. I mentioned the importance of economics to politicians and policymakers in the West. That can still be true in sub-Saharan Africa as well. So that's something that they have in common. But then perhaps the first, the, the last thing I want to say is something that Africa has that perhaps is not so common in the rest of the world, which is... Um, Cultural diversity. One thing that always astonishes me about Africa is the enormously large proportion of people who speak like five languages. And, you know, that's a mindset thing. People who think like that, you know, people, who, people who speak a lot of languages from an early age, they just think differently from poor people like me who can hardly speak French, you know. So, um, you know, so I, I, I've emphasised that, 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 that the, the, the way of thinking, you know, the way of, the reason why I made a contribution 20 years ago was because I came into this field with a mindset that was of, of an engineer, which was completely different from the mindset of the rest of the field. It's the same deal. Diversity of mindset, whether it's in the science, whether it's in the education, whether it's in the advocacy. I'm sure all of you know that I have uh, been saying for quite a few years that when this parish came along and entered the field, it was a huge step forward just because she was speaking differently than me, right? She was saying the right kind of things in very different ways. And it's the same deal, right? So the diversity is the key. Okay. Got it. Okay. And, and Patricia, I will put you in touch with us. Yes, in thank you Zola. very much. So I can better prepare my... I have 15 minutes to talk. I better say something intelligent. <laughs> Okay. The next uh, speaker is Daria Talturina. She's a board member of the International Longevity Alliance and also uh, the Longevity Escape Velocity or LEV Foundation that uh, Aubrey uh, is uh, um, founded. And uh, she also works for the Russian Research Institute for Health of the Ministry of Health. So welcome, Daria, and I give the floor to you. Uh, Daria? Okay. Hello. Thank you, dear friends. I hope you can see and hear me well. So for many years, uh, longevity research community has been advocating for calling aging a disease. And uh, I know at least two examples when uh, biomedical companies decided, like had troubles to uh, test the um, compounds, uh, drug discoveries, for uh, aging as a whole, and they had to do it for some other organs. One is, for example, uh, Professor Skulachov from Russia. So they invented uh, some uh, compound, SKQ, SQK, uh, which is an antioxidant, and we still don't know if it could help at least with some stages of aging because they had to uh, tested uh, with FDA even with dry eye for dry eye they did uh, they, uh, get a permission to sell it as a treatment for dry eye uh, but uh, they didn't find uh, investor another time uh, to test it as protect so it was a real issue for R and D uh, generally sometimes uh, governments were resistant to add aging to a disease list because they uh, need uh, international classification of diseases, not only for new R&D, but also for mortality statistics. 
uh, where aging was considered like a garbage court when uh, like uh, doctors were lazy to investigate for the cause of death. So uh, basically, uh, there was a process of revision of the international classification of diseases from uh, version 10 to 11. And uh, we, with a group of uh, my colleagues, uh, decided to write a proposal uh, to uh, have aging included to the ICD. Uh, which first we looked at the extensive literature of our field, but there was a problem that uh, it was... Uh, Daya, can I interrupt you and ask you to go full screen? Is it not? Yeah. It, here it is, right? Uh, yes, no, it is, sorry. Yes, uh, so basically uh, we wrote a proposal to the uh, working group on the new uh, ICD, our proposal was based on only human data because animal data would not fit WHO. And um, we also, there was a paper earlier published earlier in 2013, what are the criteria of uh, a disease for ICD? So we checked all these criteria and we found that aging uh, suits the definition of disease by the World Health Organization by this criteria, not uh, less than, for example, as gamer diseases, because it's also uh, there are gaps in understanding, but still it is a disease. Okay. So what happened is that the working group of the WHO um, wrote us a reply. We were very surprised because we didn't write from any institution, just a group of enthusiasts. And they said that uh, what we mentioned, like various surgeon related conditions, part of them already in the ACD, and they proposed us to have a, a extension code, which can be combined with other codes, XT9T, uh, to produce new conditions, new diseases. Also, we added a definition of aging, which was uh, discussed with Aubrey, so here is it, aging related means caused by biological aging, which persistently leads to the loss of organism's adaptation and progress in old ages. Actually, we wrote something else, now they changed it. Uh, so anyway, that's how they have it now. So that uh, inclusion of aging related codes was celebrated by the team of Lancet Journal they published a paper that it is opening the door to treating aging as a disease. And also they established a new academic journal, uh, Lancet Healthy Longevity. Uh, it managed to become quartile one, just in one year. So we can publish there too now. What we did, uh, so uh, also I want to give some um, credits to other colleagues from the UK. Uh, Highly important badly, who proposed to move this age code for age related diseases uh, from temporality section to causality section. Uh, I think it is also more logical and it suits uh, better. So we published uh, uh, our proposal, elaborated it a bit, of course, it contains maybe 600 references and published it. Uh, in a journal, and thank you very much, Sven and other, some people who are there, who maybe, uh, who facilitated this publication. Actually, we got a lot of citations already, quotated, like uh, people cite this. So, moving, trying to move. Yeah. So what does it look now, like now? Yeah. Okay, so this is an example how this combination of code looks like. Uh, well, the World Health Organization itself inscribed uh, this extension to some combination code. And here is example of other specific dis specified diseases of the blood and blood forming organs. So if we have some condition which is aging related and like aging of some part of blood and blood forming organs, we can uh, basically give it a code. And that means that we can develop therapeutics against this condition. 
So the list of these conditions, which they already included, is quite wide. For example, acquired immune deficiency. So we can develop therapeutics against immune aging and register them. So, and in some cases, uh, it may look redundant. For example, in hypertension, aging-related essential hypertension. So there are already treatments to hypertension. But we can develop now treatments, new therapies, which are targeting even early in life some specific aging-related processes, which we know, like, you know, cell senescence, for example. So it make, um, make things a little bit easier. In addition to, yeah, here is uh, other examples of such combination codes. Uh, but that is not our only win. There was another good story which happened uh, to uh, aging-related codes in the ICD. For a long time, there was always a code which was called senility uh, in World Health in ICD-10. And uh, like all, and I think it was uh, aging related uh, debility, something like this, an American version of ICD. It's kept on changing, but in general, it was like old age senility. Uh, this code was mainly used uh, when somebody, some person died in old ages, and the doctors do not have uh, idea what uh, he or she died from. For example, here is death certificate of Queen Elizabeth, who unfortunately uh, died recently, so officially she died from aging. <coughs> statisticians, uh, medical statisticians tended to consider garbage code, uh, and they tried to redistribute these deaths into other uh, causes of death when they calculate a you know, burden of disease and something. However, some French researchers um, did a study. They did autopsies of super centenarians. And in uh, some percent of cases, uh, they couldn't really determine what this person died for. And they uh, came to conclusions that it can be a real cause of death, aging, in really advanced ages. Uh, so in any case, uh, this code existed. But there was a protest against that. Uh, and a team of Brazilian gerontologists uh, wrote a, published a appeal uh, online and also in this uh, Lancet, I think, Health and Longevity, exactly this new journal, uh, calling that aging is not a disease and uh, it should be excluded from the ICD. Uh, they actually targeted this particular code, old age. So what their arguments were, they didn't want unnecessary medicalization of the elderly. Uh, let us skip that. And also they thought that it could lead to ageism, that all, all uh, older persons will be considered sick like or ill people. Uh, we had to, our community had to reply on this. And there were two teams uh, which replied, co coordinating in coordination. First of all, was our team with Ilya Stamber, Alexei Alexeyev, Yuri Matveyev. So, and in the same issue of the same health, uh, Lancet Health and Charity Journal, there was another uh, reply. Oops, oops. Yeah. I fear to re pronounce wrongly Evelyn's uh, surname, maybe Evelyn Bischoff, and other people like De uh, Alex Jankov, David Sinclair, and so on. Uh, Andrea Meyer, she's a gerontologist. So uh, we both objected uh, the idea of removing aging. Uh, both teams objected uh, per se uh, from ICD. However, our arguments were slightly different. So we, we did not really mind of uh, renaming somehow this code, old age. So our argument was that we still need uh, advanced aging to be represented, represented in the ICD. First of all, aging does have a pathological effect and the, we needed for just new therapies uh, development uh, to be registered. And that uh, we argued that this code has always been in the ICD. And uh, 
Evelyn's and others, they argued that uh, they thought that they wanted to replace it with frailty. They argued that it is not a replacement. It is not indeed. That it is easy and again, we need longevity medicine. So in any case, uh, the result was good for everyone. Just one second. I'm struggling with it. System. Yeah, so the result was uh, is that they have new code. It's called aging related decline in intrinsic capacity instead of old age, which is which was always there. So okay. what is this? How where does this come from? First of all, uh, at some point they published uh, synonyms of this code. Sorry for small uh, letters, but still, uh, the synonyms of this new code, MG2As, are even also aging. And uh, basically, we have a code for aging now, for aging as a whole. So now we can develop therapies for gerber protection, generally, anti aging therapies, and go register them. So what is this intrinsic capacity? It was a quite funny story of lobbyism. There was a, a period when the European Union tried to uh, develop priorities for its research program, Horizon 2020. And Eduard Deveni and also Miriam participated there. They were very successful and they pushed for money for aging uh, biological research on biological aging. However, uh, there were some interests, uh, like maybe corporations, which also wanted to participate. And uh, there were some people from the group of industries of uh, food supplements or functional food, I would say, yeah, functional food. And most importantly, there was industry which uh, produced some uh, tools, devices to uh, facilitate all the disabled people. So they invented a division between functional ability and intrinsic capacity. For example, you have, uh, uh, if you're lo losing your hearing, uh, you can put this uh, hearing aid. So your intrinsic capacity will be bad, but your functional ability will be fine. And um, uh, basically in this way, uh, the agenda of biological aging was diluted in this Horizon 2020 research program. However, we still know that despite this, uh, a lot of people still, a lot of res aging researchers still uh, received grant uh, through this pro program, even if, if it is less than it could have been. Anyway, because of this uh, strange lobbyism in this, uh, Global Strategy and Action Plan for Aging and Health, which was developed by World Health Organization in 2014, there was this strange term, intrinsic capacity, uh, which is uh, determined by many factors, health-related behavior, presence or absence of disease. So they also added that there are five subdomains of intrinsic capacity, neuromuscular, sensory, metabolic, cognitive, and psychological. So, in any case, we actually was in the delegation at this World Health Organization meeting. Uh, we were part of the Russian delegation to, together with Vladimir Anisimov and Viktor Zikov, and we were like arguing, like, uh, what is this term? And uh, also we were arguing to include research section into the strategy. Actually, we succeeded with research section into the strategy, but it was a bit too late, uh, so the term persisted. But now, look, how funny is that? So we had two streams of lobbying, uh, which were not uh, for uh, anti-aging research, but they combined all together and produced quite a code, which is much better for us than, for example, world age. So I think it's a very good uh, luck for us. Uh, so we now we have both two codes. First, uh, just uh, aging related decline in intrinsic capacity, which still needs to be defined, but still it's clear it's uh, aging, which uh, uh, also can be counted starting uh, early, for example, in middle ages. So now we can really uh, develop um, and register new therapies against aging. It is in the World Health Organization list of diseases. 
And also we have another code for uh, agent specific conditions, uh, which is called can, like this combination code and uh, the list is quite high. So I think that uh, these days, uh, our, uh, our developers of new therapies are in very good situation, which has not been there before. And it is indeed possible to argue uh, and look for investments into this research uh, because it is not as hopeless in terms of money return as it was before. Uh, in addition to this, we see a change uh, in a new position of the World Health Organization, a new uh, sort of the thought thinking of aging. So if you go to just the page of the World Health Organizations, they write there wonderful things. At biological level, aging results from the impact of accumulation of wide variety of molecular and cellular damage over time. This leads to a gradual decrease in physical and mental capacity, a growing risk of disease, and ultimately death. I think it's a nice definition. Uh, so basically, we have a World Health Organization finally uh, taking aging seriously as a risk factor for health and uh, perhaps as a disease. Uh, as Ilya mentioned, there is a working group to define what is uh, intrinsic capacity. It uh, includes medical gerontologists. Perhaps we need maybe to put more efforts into finding what they do, maybe getting included. In any case, uh, it is indeed a very good development. And so please uh, tell everybody who is working in the field of R&D for aging that uh, good times are coming and then now they can develop and register anti-aging therapies. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Daria, for this uh, uh, wonderful lecture. Um, so uh, are there questions? Uh, I haven't seen one in the chat. Unless I missed, uh, Diti has a question, yes. Yes, if if uh, if there are no other questions, of course, only. Uh, so, uh, congratulations uh, once again, uh, Daria, and also to all people who were working uh, on this. Well, I was working on this, but for, from uh, uh, further away than uh, than most of you. Uh, congratulations again, uh, and uh, like you said at the end, uh, the um, you said. Now the the field is uh, let's say open to uh, organizations for clinical trials. How to let's say push or how to make this uh, uh, more well known for these uh, uh, organizations for clinical trials? Because as far as I know, but I, I would I would love to be wrong. But as far as I know, uh, until now there are not so many uh, things announced. Uh, Especially when there is this famous uh, team study uh, not starting, but uh, there is a twin study, but nothing else as far as I know. Thank hmm. you. Okay, so the organizations which do clinical trials are paid agents, and they need to be independent by the law, by standards, uh, how they call it, G good clinical trial standards, GCP, from the developer of the therapy. So they, they basically will not care. Uh, um, what to test, uh, they only care about quality of the uh, study. Uh, so I think it's important to advocate uh, this new opportunity just to inform investors, inform uh, researchers on that. Maybe so we're actually uh, re writing a paper and looking for a journal where we could publish it so to inform academic community but it will be also good to spread the world and maybe spread the good news in uh, maybe some media uh, websites uh, where which are read by this by tech people. So we just need to tell people about this new opportunity. Okay, uh, I think we shall keep it to the final question. Uh, Leon uh, asked in the chat. Have you considered that the so-called standards of care uh, vary drastic, dramatically among countries, meaning insurance will not authorize certain procedures for the elderly? 
at the hospitals, which affects longevity stats, perhaps more than diet or genetic composition. Would you comment? Mm. Okay, we have USA where there is a commission, sort of, this decides which, uh, uh, which diseases will be covered by uh, insurance. And uh, for, other, uh, can, for other countries, for other legislations, it is very different uh, procedures. Uh, so it, each country is different, but the more will be, there will be clinical success, the easier it will be uh, to move it, uh, to, uh, to proceed with in, uh, having uh, this insurance, covered by insurance. Okay. Thank you, Daria. Uh, and we can then go to the next speaker. Martin, are you there? I hope so, yeah. Okay, great. You can start <laughs> sharing your screen. So um, the next speaker is Martin Odia. He is an MBA and a businessman, a published author, and the current CEO of the Longevity Events Limited, which uh, holds the annual Longevity Summit in uh, uh, Dublin, as uh, Aubrey already uh, mentioned earlier. So, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you. And the screen is sharing okay and everything? Yes. Okay. So, thanks, uh, Didier and Sven and team um, for the invitation and for running the event. Um, I, had, I think I have six minutes, so I better go real quick. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I just want to, to take a, a step back, take a, a kind of a broad perspective on the field, what we're doing the frustrations around it, and maybe some suggestions as to how we might accelerate process, progress. Um, and it's a rather provocative title, but it's not, you know, for, for Jose's benefit, it's not that I'm shouting Viva la Revolution here um, necessarily. It's just to look at, at some limits regarding the market economy model that we currently have, and maybe shifts in focus towards other um, methods of, of working together and collaborating. Um, so just change the screen. Yeah, so the, the idea, as I've, I've said, is to look at um, potential for collaborative models and also the role of not-for-profits um, in, in accelerating this, the, the fight we have against diseases <clears throat> and maybe looking as well at, you know, the, the idea that we, we haven't done an amazing job through the market, uh, market economics model. And I would just say that when we're talking about market economics and the, the capitalist system, um, although not Viva la Revolution necessarily, we, we should kind of keep in mind that this is a, a model, a construct that's inherited from you know the aristocratic uh, society of the Industrial Revolution. So while useful certainly in some circumstances, it should be like everything else, it should be open to uh, challenge, amending, changing, modifying, um, particularly in an era of such advanced technology where uh, the limits of companies um, might uh, cause strain. So I think, um, you know, we've all, we're all familiar with the idea of 110,000 people dying each day from aging. Um, and we should pause on the, the morality of that, I think, uh, because it is a pretty horrendous uh, thing. And also even that gets us off a little bit. 110,000 people die every day is like a one-off event. But the reality is, of course, for the vast majority of those, the preceding 10 years has been unpleasant. The preceding year has been pretty horrendous with maybe dementia and incontinence and immobility and fragility and all these other things going on. It's a really, really unpleasant process. So we have that moral side when we're trying to advocate and, and reorient our efforts. Um, we also don't have a huge financial impetus to, to, make, uh, to make gains in this field, uh, an enormous um, financial incentive. So as a society, I think the point to make is that the financial incentive is there. But how does that transfer across then into specific uh, companies and how we organize things currently? So um, <clears throat> there's a funding mismatch. Uh, the, the research into the biology of aging is less than 1%. The research uh, that goes into the chronic diseases and interventions. Now, that does make sense when you look at the previous slide because we, we still frame this as the cost of the different diseases and then we add it all together rather than saying 
the cost of aging, which is the precursor to all those diseases. Obviously, Aubrey's on the call and has been shouting about this for 20 years. Um, uh, and it's getting there. The, the landscape is certainly changing. Um, but there's still an awful long way to go um, from trying to hammer that message home that, you know, we shouldn't be so kind of unbalanced in, in our investment and our research efforts. Okay, um, I was thinking of an analogy to this. So uh, a town near where I grew up, every year in the 80s, they had a flood, like almost religiously every year. Um, and they put down sandbags at the, the doors of the houses and the shops. And every year the floods came in and every year, you know, a lot of damage was done and it cost a lot of money and, and, and so on. And then at some point, somebody went two or three miles up river and widen the bed of the river, and they haven't had a flood since. And <clears throat> this notion of going upstream rather than, you know, firefighting or trying to sandbag the, the, the floods uh, is something that we really have to try to find ways in our ad advocacy to hammer home. Um, it's difficult, it's challenging, it's a change in paradigm, but, um, you know, it's something that we really should uh, spend more and more time explaining that it, what we're trying to do is widen the riverbed and not just put the sandbags down when the floods come of the different diseases. Um, okay, so I wasn't wanted to identify the core problems as I see them at the moment, um, or at least some of them, um, but I will concentrate on, on number three and number four. So co coalescing around an, an agreed aging clock um, to measure the impact is something that I think a lot of people have discussed. In, in recent times, um, there are many clocks, uh, they are kind of evolving all the time, but there is an argument to be said that we just need to collectively with the leading scientists, uh, many of whom are on the call, collectively decide upon a clock or a series of clocks and say, this is the measurement method we're going to use and then bring that to regulators. Um, and that this might in some way allow us to measure that that we're trying to intervene with. The second one is the regulatory impasse around the holistic decline of aging as a disease. Yeah, and we have plenty of conversation about that already and the great work done by Daria <clears throat> and others. Um, but yeah, at the moment, people who are who are researching interventions, interventions in aging are still probably going to put it under the label of Parkinson's or something like that and try to run it through uh, a, a trial. Um, the lack of incentives across the players involved is one of the two things I want to look at for the rest of this talk um and and also the, the need to imagine different models because just of the sheer complexity of the task that we're undertaking so um just for a moment i'm gonna imagine a world so a thought experiment let's say we did uh we did realize the magnitude of this the inordinate suffering the the huge loss of of life and um, intelligence and wisdom and experience um, and the, the continuation of this. And we, we decided as a, as a globe, okay, we're actually going to concentrate on this and nothing else. So for the fun, the, the purpose of this thought experiment is to push the limits of what we could do. So theoretically, we could get, you know, all the adults in the world to agree. Uh, let's keep some of them, you know, for ambulances and stuff like that. But, you know, generally, let's get them to work on aging. Let's use the ridiculous volume of computational capacity that we have, the huge data centers, the constantly evolving AI to, to screen molecules, to assess different species, to do all of those wonderful things that we could do. Imagine if we could do it, you know, hundreds of thousands of times the level that we're doing now. Give the right people lab access, Give make sure that there is no financial limitation here or there's no shareholder imperative. It is just a goal of resolving aging, and that's the only goal we have. So that's the nirvana type world. Um, and it would be an interesting question to ask the scientists on, on, on the call or elsewhere, like in that scenario, and I, I know it's only an estimate, but how long does it take to get to a point where you reach longevity escape velocity? If you really could harness all the resources in the world. Obviously, <clears throat> we have nothing like that. Um, and if we look at what we are doing now, in some ways, it's great. And in some ways, it's disappointing. It, you know, are you half glass or half full kind of person? 
so yeah repurpose drugs um lifestyle and, and supplementation calorie restriction mimetics um which i know you know is kind of repetitive but i liked that little icon particularly um and longevity clinics uh so these have impacts and this isn't to say that these are bad things or these are unnecessary or unwelcomed the reality is that lots of people go to conferences all year and have meetings and, and discussions around how to design better weapons to kill each other so i wouldn't you know suggest that people working in these areas are doing anything other than really stellar and important work um, and it is work that will help us to get to a point where we can get to the other points um, but it will only get you so far obviously and there are limitations to what you can achieve by focusing on these areas and realistically a huge amount of the money that is being spent now is being spent within this kind of slides um you know contents so why is that well i would argue that it's the profit motive and it's the focus on profit that is sort of you know ingrained in the systems that we use so I, I, the point that's being made in this slide is yeah we focus mostly on low-hanging fruit we get that <clears throat> we can by the growing awareness of the field we can widen the focus a little bit and we can get synalytics and so on funded to a point where they go to trial but um the really really challenging stuff uh still isn't getting a whole lot of of investment um and you know, th th that's the nature of the beast of a, a firm that has shareholders that are looking for a return. Um, they're, they almost have to, you, if you if you look through the details of the corporate governance and all of that stuff, you'll see that there, was, there really is no escaping the imperative to chase profit. It, it's almost impossible to take a really long-term perspective or to take a, a, a loss-making perspective for a higher goal or higher um aspiration so it, it's kind of um it's it can be morally perplexing but it's logically unavoidable that this is where the focus will be on the low hanging fruit on the things that are relatively easy to prove and show and, and work on okay so just to, to kind of keep it moving then um i guess one of the points i wanted to make was that you know as everyone here is aware, this is an incredibly complicated uh, task that's being undertaken. Um, and yeah, the, like <clears throat> even the idea of a company, the size and scale of Google and their, their Calico or Alphabet's uh, subsidiary Calico, with the billions of dollars that they have, do we really think that inside the four walls of any one organization, we're going to be able to tackle something as immensely complex as um, aging. Um, and I would argue that that seems highly unlikely, that the, the necessity to share information and to build on other people's work and, and, and to avoid duplication as well, to avoid, you know, Spin running one experiment for a year and Didier running the same experiment for a year. That's a wasted year. You know, if they talk to each other at the beginning and they represent two companies, then they can work on two different areas and find, you know, some intelligent ways to deal with IP. IP will will remain, I guess, a fact of life. But yes, it is a, an extraordinarily complex um, task that we're trying to to take take on. Um, and I think as well, <clears throat> for what it's worth, I, I was listening to. Um, Yao yesterday talking about, you know, the interventions having an impact. Maybe they're only addressing diseases and maybe they're not, you know, um, the, the impact they're having on, on lifespan is just as a result of addressing the diseases rather than the actual decline and the deterioration that happens across time. Um, and to me, uh, it feels, and again, this is an, a non-scientific perspective, but it, it feels a bit like spinning plates. So um, you have a series of plates spinning, and to be honest, once one or two of those plates fall, it's kind of the whole system falls apart a little bit. Um, and so it would seem to me that the only way you get serious 
uh, impact on lifespan and on health span even. Um, and I mean, you know, serious, substantial impact. The only way you do that is by keeping all of the plates spinning or, or nearly all of the plates spinning. Um, and that requires an enormous investment. No, not to be just kind of promoting what LAVA is doing, but the, the major mass rejuvenation where you're doing multiple interventions concurrently and comparing those with, you know, controls and so on. That to me, just in my simple interpretation, but that's the only thing that really makes sense. But that's expensive. It's big. It's challenging. Uh, it will require for us to get to the point where we, we have success. I'm sure there'll be plenty of failures. There'll be plenty of things that cancel each other out or, or cause trouble, et cetera. But if, if we're to actually intervene in aging, if we're to actually, you know, substantially uh, increase lifespan, yes, we can do all of the things on supplements and diets and, and repurpose drugs and everything else like that, and even the stages in between. But ultimately, we, we're going to have to do multiple interventions at the same time. And to do this, we require, uh, you know, a really substantial amount of money. Um, and so I talked about the freedom of not-for-profits. And the freedom there is to pursue a mission without having the shareholder over your shoulder requiring a return. Um, no, I think any model of collaboration actually is really useful. Um, and it was interesting to hear about Vida Dow. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think that the, all of those kind of decentralized collaborative models um, are to be encouraged and are great and everything. I, I wonder what happens when they get to a point where they need to uh, bring on other investors to take on bigger tasks. Now, maybe they can they can circumvent that. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. But at some point, the same issues may rear their heads again. So I think we need to find, we need to invest heavily in, in not-for-profits and it doesn't have to be lab only, it can be others as well, but we need to invest heavily in those. We need to make sure their missions are pure um, and then we need to take on the high hanging fruit, you know, the top of that tree, because we're all getting older, we're running out of time here. Um, and and in some ways we're, we're kind of, it feels like we're just, you know, Kind of tinkling around the edges rather than actually getting to the core of us. Um, so, um, yeah, I I don't have a whole lot uh, more to add. Um, it, it, it can be uh, something, I think, when, when, with the collaboration that allows for um, like an open collaboration of data. So I know Didier is going to speak about this. I think there's a healthy data, healthy data, healthy data space or something, health data space or something like this in Europe at the moment. And it's interesting to see that, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are, are mad to get access to patients' data, but they have little interest in sharing data. So to finish off my talk, I was just going to say that for, not-for-profits can support for profits by example and by leadership. Um, and that's definitely something that can happen you can show the, the if you show them the multiple interventions work to some degree then they will follow suit and they will change their their trajectory um but i think another thing that maybe we can do that, that combines advocacy with the idea of um you know challenging the for-profit system the only thing i've seen in my lifetime that, that has worked here is what's called csr or corporate social responsibility now it doesn't buck the whole system but it definitely has an impact so if you go to the 70s, economists would have argued the company's only responsibility, this is a very famous expression, it's only responsibility is to its shareholders. And they would have said at the time, like, of course, who else are they responsible to? They own the company. And they would have further argued that a company should only compete really hard with other companies. And overall for society, that benefited because it bought down the price and increased the quality of of products and services. So that was all fine. These people would say that a company giving money to charity or to any other social cause was ridiculous. They would have argued that other people in society should do that. And the companies should just focus on competition and on reducing their prices and improving their own. Now, that argument held water right up until the 80s and maybe even the 90s. And then that argument lost out basically to this notion of CSR. 
corporate social responsibility. And that has many different guises. But ultimately, what it is, is the public pressurizing companies by even the threat of their euro or their dollar going elsewhere if they don't take certain um, moral decisions or if they don't at least be seen to be taking those decisions. So I'm not 100% sure how we might frame this, but um, to, to, to look at what Didier is talking about and to look at the idea of sharing data, if there's some really simplistic encapsulation of how we can get anyone in the health sector, anyone definitely in digital health, because there's so much information available, it's being tracked on your watch all day, every day. If we can force the for-profit sector to share as much of that as possible under a type of CSR pressure, then I think that might be beneficial because researchers around the world would love to get access to this data. And I know some data will need to stay behind IP, and I, I get that, but I think we can definitely pressurize companies by explaining to the public, look, this is, and this can be health rather than longevity specific, but explaining to the public that this is hugely beneficial. If these companies do this, uh, it doesn't cost them much or anything, and it will help other researchers, other scientists to, to, to take forward other treatments. Um, but to do that, companies need to sign up to whatever we decide to call this notion of uh, data sharing and health data sharing um, that the CSR machine turns on. Um, okay, that's it. Um, thanks again to the organizers. Okay, uh, thank you, Martin, uh, for this uh, lecture. Um, I see there is some questions out there. Um, Leon uh, asks, so how do we break the spell of entrepreneurship and uh, venture capital incentivize, incentivizing everyone to repackage bad science into business plans and longevity products? Yeah, I suppose that's the, that's the question I was asking through, through the whole um, talk as well. Uh, I think not-for-profits do help an awful lot. I think um, I think things like Vita Da and so on show uh, the desire to reimagine um, how we go about this. And, and generally, the incentives in this industry are a hell of a lot better than the incentives in other industries. Oh, sorry, not the incentives, the motivations. Um, but it's extremely difficult. That's the system we're immersed in. Um, and it's, it's really, really difficult to avoid the, the profit motive. Uh, and Walter asks, not-for-profits often patent their useful findings, for example, the Sense Foundation, holding it back from general accessibility. How do you beat that? Well, I mean, I would have thought that the idea of a not-for-profit is that you work towards a mission um, and that you don't necessarily compromise that mission. Can other organizations spin you know, out? Like, I would think that if, if the LEVF foundation makes a, a discovery or a, a, an advantage there will be companies that will come from that um that's what's already happened with since i guess and aubrey's work is things were you know worked on 15 years ago and they are now you know the centers of of industries that we have so there is a natural progression from not-for-profit into for-profit but um the not-for-profits i guess should be dedicated to the mission okay yeah, aubrey I, has I, maybe I, a question or wants to respond yeah, I will respond um, because, I mean, Walter makes a very good point, um, but certainly um, an organization like Sense Research Foundation or LEV Foundation, because we are working on quite uh, on really very early stage research, it means that the uh, profit motive is rather different than it would be for a nonprofit working at, on, at, at the clinical level, for example, where something is quite close to actual revenue. The difference really is that um, neither SRF nor LV LEVF would see ourselves as uh, aiming to mainly obtain our revenue from, um, you know, royalties or whatever on things that somebody else is selling. Uh, it's simply because that would be too far in the future. And therefore, we would tend, yes, we would have the, have the IP, but that would be not for our benefit, but for the benefit of those who would take that IP forward through the commercialization stages, through the later stages. And I mean, so when we would spin out um, startup companies from SRF, um, we would always take only a very modest equity position so as not to dilute other investors and so to maximally incentivize people to do that. 
and the same the same impli- the same applies to sharing of information in general. So you know, I sign NDAs left, right, and centre, and I encourage other people to do the same, precisely in order to ensure that the information is locked up as little as possible. Okay. Yes, uh, one of the problems is, of course, that if you don't patent something, then typically things just stay in academia and don't move forward because uh, no company is interested in something that is, isn't patented and cannot result in any profit. Um, so the question is, is there anyone who still has uh, a question for Martin? Or uh, is there someone who has a question for any of the previous speakers? Um, and after that, we will go on a break. Anyone? Or you all are urging to get a break and have a coffee? Okay, well, then let's have a short 20-minute uh, break and see you back uh, at 1940 my time. I don't know what time that is uh, for you. See you soon.
Didier, are you there?
Okay, I will assume that everyone has found their seats. <laughs> I'm sure not everyone has, but let's get going. Um, Steph, uh, the first speaker is Stefan Lorenz, forgive me, Sernier, I hope. Uh, and he will be speaking about, uh, oh my, I've lost it. There it is. A democratic use of our digital data. Thanks Here we go. A lot. Thanks a lot for the for the preview. It, it's Sorgner, Sorgner, just See. how to pronounce it. Doesn't matter. Okay. All fine. Um, yeah. I didn't realize you were actually an American. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'll show that when choosing between health and privacy, we should go for freedom, or why Harari is wrong. Harari claims in his opinion piece, the world after the coronavirus from 2020, I quote, asking people to choose between privacy and health is in fact the very root of the problem because this is a false choice. We can and should enjoy both privacy and health. We can choose to protect our health and stop the coronavirus epidemic, not by instituting totalitarian surveillance regimes, but rather by empowering citizens, unquote. But Harari is wrong to promote health effectively, large amounts of data are needed. The more data we can use, the more reliable are the resulting correlations of health and our behavior, genes and external influences, and many other things. Such data are also needed for innovation, scientific research, and policy making. All these procedures are of central importance for our country. Extensive amounts of data are needed for the econ economic, health, and social prosperity of a country. However, it must be ensured that the data are used democratically. Such a structure does not yet exist at present. In the USA, data are primarily collected by large companies, and this turns them into quasi-political actors, which has the potential to undermine the foundation of free democratic society. In China, data are collected by the government on the basis of values and norms that cannot be reconciled with the achievements of the Enlightenment. The structures currently prevailing in Europe undermine our strongest interests. And here, the focus is on data protection. The possibility of achieving an extensive collection of digital data at political level as well is being practically undermined. However, this also means that we are losing the opportunity to use the data for democratic interests and to promote our health. Collecting data is particularly important when it comes to the issue of health. If we have to choose between health and privacy, we should choose health because the majority of citizens identify an increased health span with a better quality of life. We have no reasons for being sad about giving up on privacy. We should not cherish privacy, but we should cherish freedom. We can, help and we can have health and freedom, but not health and privacy. Why do we think we need privacy? There are two main theories that explain this, the property theory and the sanction theory, and they are not mutually exclusive. According to the property theory, data are our intellectual property and therefore an extension of ourselves. So we mix ourselves with something external and thus we gain uh, intellectual property rights. If governments or anybody else takes away our data, they seem to expropriate us. But is this necessarily the case? If data are our property that we can exchange for other goods in our favor, such as our health insurance, then this is not an expropriation. Having a universal health insurance is an enormously important achievement, but keeping the system alive demands huge financial inflows. 
using our data to partially compensate for the service is in the interest of the society. Furthermore, the sanction theory states that we fear that the data being collected, stored, and used by a government should be the grounding for sanctions against it. We fear sanctions. However, sanctions are necessary. If a murder of an innocent child gets caught and sanctioned, this is just and widely accepted by the society. We merely don't wish to be sanctioned for acts which should not be sanctioned, neither morally, institutionally, nor legally. And this is the crucial issue. The fear of such sanctions is also the reason why we fear our personal data being stored at one place. But how can these fears be dispelled? First, we need to reduce the possibility of access to the data by humans because the risk of abuse is too high. Data access should primarily be granted to algorithms. Only in specialized circumstances, humans should have the right to access the data. And this is a significant challenge which permanently needs to be dealt with conclusively. Second, we need to become much more open and pluralistic. Only acts ought to be punished where direct harm is being done to another person. Currently, this is far from being the case in many parts of the world, even the most developed countries. Third, in, uh, third we should promote e-government to make decision-making processes concerning our data more transparent. A lot more would have to be said on this issue, from the need to establish a well-functioning, fast-operating infrastructure to the need to realize reliable algorithms to reduce the need for human intervention. The regulation I suggest has the advantage that the digital data are also being used to at least partially pay for the universal health care, which is an, an enormous achievement. It takes seriously the relevance of data collection for innovation, scientific research, and policy making. It's in the interest of the people as well as of a government to be able to collect and use digital data to guarantee that an enormous plurality of different lifestyles can be embraced in a society while a highly efficient universal healthcare system is available we need a democratic usage of our digital data and this approach seems a promising initial step for developing appropriate social legal and political structures for realizing a proper democratic usage of our digital data if a government stores all digital data and uses them then it can be argued that expropriation occurs which would be an illegitimate harm being done to persons. However, this needs to be resolved. It would not be an expropriation of our digital data, of our intellectual property, if the data were used in a democratic manner and were used to, so that it, um, it helps to finance our interests. And here's the issue of health consent. The majority of citizens identify an increased health span with a higher quality of life. And this matters politically. And this is the reason why universal public health insurance is politically justified. Yet the costs for upholding such a system are enormous. Its relevance is enormous too. So even in Europe, the differences concerning the quality of universal public health care systems are enormous. Healthcare is incredibly expensive, yet it's in our interest. If the digital data were used to at least partially cover the costs of a universal public health insurance, it would not be an expropriation, but rather the payment for a service which is widely requested. Most people identify an increased health span with an increased quality of life. As having a health insurance is, is a widely shared human interest, it's a duty of the government to provide people with it. Developing a new drug is risky and costs a lot of money. If a pharmaceutical company has successfully developed a new drug and has patented the invention, they've got the exclusive right for 20 years to realize a financial gain out of their patent. They can charge whatever amount of money they want for the drug developed. And this makes sense as they took the risk and financial burden to develop the drug in the first place. However, data are needed for developing new drugs. And where do they get the data from? In a political regime with a total surveillance, data, digital surveillance system, the government stores and projects um, the available per personalized data. And they can pass depersonalized versions of the data onto others, for example, drug companies. And in this way, certain limitations can be imposed on the developing company. The pharmaceutical company can no longer charge whatever is in the interest as the drug was developed on the basis of data provided by the people. The data were made accessible on the basis of a contract with the government which limits the right of the drug company. And in this way, it can be guaranteed that newly developed drugs can be made available to the people on a financially more accessible basis or in a way that it can be included in the universal health insurance. So hence, storing and using the data by the government is not or doesn't have to be an expropriation by 
but it can be a payment. And in, in these circumstances, it would be a payment. We support the payment of a universal health insurance by means of our personalized data. And this is what I mean by democratizing the use of collecting data. Nevertheless, it can be objected that even though I permanently stress the relevance of the norm of negative freedom, as I do in many of my writings, and the, and the need to promote plurality further, does my claim that all we all need to embrace total surveillance or um, collection of digital data and not undermine the relevance of freedom? It's clear that it does. No society can have absolute freedom. Sanctions for certain behavior are necessary. If someone kills an innocent person, the murderer needs to be punished. Can a certain type of bodily harm become legally obligatory? Vaccinations are the best example. Still, one can wonder whether it wouldn't be more in tune with the normal freedom if the dropping out option existed. That means if it was possible not to be forced to pay for the universal health insurance by means of, of the collection of digital data. So if citizens prefer to pay for the universal health insurance with money rather than with personalized data, should a social liberal democratic society not offer their citizens this option? Negative freedom is a wonderful achievement. Maybe this option should be available. However, what would be the consequences? How much would it cost to pay for the universal health insurance with money rather than with personalized data? If it doesn't cost much, then many citizens might choose this option, which would undermine the goal of collecting the data in the first place, and the dropping out option would get more expensive. In this case, only very few rich citizens could afford it. Does it not undermine freedom too? If the power difference between the rich and the poor gets too big, then the economically weaker ones are under an illegitimate pressure. Hence, freedom undermines itself if one provided citizens with a dropping out option. So even though it initially seems to be more in tune with negative freedom if a dropping out option was legally provided, given further reflections, it seems more likely that in this case, freedom undermines itself. In any case, further reflections and practical evidence are needed for further judgment on this issue. It was obviously not my intention to develop the fully worked out political system involving algorithmic data processing here. I don't even think any one answer can ever be fully convincing and appropriate for all systems. I merely wish to show that embracing the collection of digital, digital data or total digital surveillance and the loss of privacy which goes along with it can be in tune with the affirmation of the norm of freedom and that it's in our interest to implement such structures as this seems to be the most promising way of using digital data in a democratic manner and not in a way that it primarily serves the interests of governments or private companies. In a way, this would be a, a proper democratic usage of a data, maybe even a European social credit system which includes a democratic usage of a data, digital data could be developed in this manner. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to discussing these issues with you further. Many thanks for your time. Thank, thank you, Stefan. So let's see. I guess I have the first question here. Wouldn't it make sense to require anonymization of health data prior to required general release? It, it wouldn't be a general release. It would be sort of whenever it gets released, yes, then the data would, um, would have to be um, depersonalized or uh, anonymized, at least uh, depersonalized. One could simply leave me. Um, that, would, that would definitely be needed in any case. Um, um, also, when the processing already of the data um, should be primarily done, sort of once it's collected by a government, the data processing should be done primarily by algorithms. But because once, I mean, any human being having access to such data, so, sort of the risk of, 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 of abuse is indeed enormous, sort of just blackmailing some people with having some, or using them in some way in, in one's own interest. And that I'm I'm extremely scared of that, and I'm 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 aware that this is a major challenge. But um, I don't think uh, the advantages which go along with sort of which having these data, in particular for for making research concerning increasing the health span, but also then as a consequence then for paying for universal health insurance, the advantages are too big um, and that that we can basically uh, we can we we cannot embrace. It. Not embracing this option is not a pragmatically realistic option. Okay. 
Well, all right. The next question comes from Martin. Argument that we need to give up our data for financing public health care can be resolved with simpler measures of higher taxes for the companies. Moreover, if the EU states sell data to private companies, the latter get all the data and power that comes with it, the same as in USA model. Can you defend your argument? I'm, I'm, um, so I'm, I'm look aware at, that basically... Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, you might want to look at the... Uh, the text to make sure you get the whole question. Um, yeah, I'm okay. Go to chat. You'll see it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is more efficient. That's the main argument, basically. Um, I'm aware. So basically, I'm I'm aware that um, um, companies are more innovative than sort of a public institutions. Um, um, I've got a couple of worries which go along, um, which why I think the option which um, sort of the collecting of digital data should should be done by uh, should be done by by democratic social liberal democratic governments rather than by private companies. So, well, the strongest argument um, in favor of companies they are more innovative, they are more <laughs> flexible, they can be more adaptive. However, once the data is being collected, then it's in the hand of the companies, and it's a, you know, um, information is power, and and power basically in the hands of of, of companies um, has the implication I have to worry that that could lead to political influence. Um, so basically, in that case, the companies become political players, and um, and I've, in the end, sort of my counter one of the counter arguments I have more trust in the data being stored safely if it's being collected by a, by a liberal, social liberal, liberal democratic government than it is being done by a, by a company. Um, and the second argument, it is more efficient if the, if the data are collected by, by a government, you know, like a European Union government coming together, they can legally enforce the regulation so that basically um, all the data have to be collected. Um, in, in this way, it is possible. It is possible to 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 um, you know um, have the data by by everyone involved at least within a certain within a certain um, a, a country within the European Union. So in that case, it would be more efficient um, um, in order to get more more of the data. Um, in the other case, um, the companies would have to be so good, would have to be so convincing. Um, that, that the people adopt their models in order to get the data and only very small set um, could, could be collected. But um, my main worry is um, that the data is being stored more safely. I basically have much more trust in a lib liberal social democratic government than I have in, 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 in a company. And, and, and I'm aware that uh, even in liberal social democratic governments, things can go terribly wrong. New leaders can be elected which don't respect don't have the same respect for for or want to use the data in their own in their own personal interest. But this is this is basically we need to fight for that. It's um, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen, um, that the data doesn't is is not being abused. But I can see your point. So no, it, I'm open for a discussion. But I think why why I favored sort of the model I've been presenting I, because is is really the the, tr the lack of trust in companies. I guess that's the end of the questions, but I would like to ask. Um, was it? You know, Walter, Walter, there are yeah. people raising their hands like me. Oh, oh uh, I see them. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. OK, go ahead, Jose, since you're here. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Stefan, I totally agree. I think that Western democratic uh, uh, liberal countries are more reliable, uh, hopefully, than companies and even more reliable than Eastern totalitarian governments. Uh, so I would put them in that order. However, uh, besides that, also some IT people have said privacy is dead. Get over it. So basically, um, you know, we can sequence your genome just by touching you. I can sequence your genome. So, so I think all this privacy, you know, it's overblown also because uh, anyone can sequence the genome and know everything about you. So what is your take on that? Yeah, I, I I agree, but basically the the, the laws, 
the laws go against, the, the laws prohibit us to do so, in, in particular with the GDPR. Um, and, and, and whenever, sort of whenever in public circumstances um, in, in, in continental Europe, um, that's the that's reply you get. We want our privacy to be protected. We cherish the achievement of the GDPR. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm having actually, yeah, in several discussions with, with people who, Paul Nemitz, for example, who's, who's strongly responsible for implementing the GDPR in, in the European Union. Um, but in the end, I, I don't find their their argument very convincing. But they've got the, the they've got the crowding. They've got basically um, the crowding by the European by by the people in, in the various countries, and and that is that is a challenge basically. Um, I, 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 I sort of the majority of citizens seem to favor this option um, of, of of upholding privacy of not not having it collected. And it is the, the, the greatest worry of actually implementing an, a more open regulation is that it, it, it definitely goes against the, what, what seems to be the dominant interest in European countries. And I fear that um, we will have to, um, people will only change their minds once they realize the, what it means that information is power. And once the, the money basically is leaving Europe and we will not have we will not have a quality of lives compared, or we will be much worse off than the United States or Eastern Asian countries. And then, then people will realize what it, what uh, information is power means and what the relevance of digital data is. And once, once even relatively speaking, you know, the Chinese are better off than, than we are. And um, I hope, I, I'm trying to convince and make people aware of the incredible importance of having the personalized data collected. But I'm aware there's a strong political hindrance in, in Europe um, uh, among the citizens for doing so. And yes, so I hope we, we manage to show the relevance and make people aware of that, no? Very well. Didier, could you make it quick? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, so uh, you... I have many, many comments, but yeah, like you know, globally, I agree uh, with you in many points. And by the way, uh, here I totally also agree with uh, uh, Jose. Um, it's a sad situation that uh, uh, at the moment, uh, it is where the data the most needed, where the data is the most needed, that we use it uh, the less. In the most democratic country, we use it uh, uh, less than in other countries, and so on and so on. Uh, I like a lot uh, what you said about, uh, yeah, let's, uh, uh, it, it has to be in uh, used by, uh, let's say, artificial intelligence and not by humans, so you have more privacy. Uh, that is, that's a great way uh, to say it. Just maybe you can comment a, a little bit about uh, the European health data space. I will comment on it also at the end, but I think it's really going directly in the good direction. What is for you not going in the good direction in the European health data space? Oh, if I may, uh, before you before you speak, yeah. Liz, could you get your question in real quick? We don't we're running out of time, just so that. Can yeah, I'll go, I'll go quick. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. So I have definitely pushed for people sharing their health data for years. Uh, we, Our company definitely are professionals at anonymizing data, but I won't speak for myself. One, one area of concern that I have with Stefan's talk, even though I agree with the, the entire premise, is that actually business is your translational engine. If you do not share health data with companies, they cannot translate drugs to you. So governments are one level and universities are actually the hub of innovation, not, not businesses. Businesses translate value. Businesses only make money if that value turns into something for you. I would definitely push for the open source of human data to companies. That's your number one best outcome. Um, you know, universities sit on thousands of patents every year that never translate to industry because industry can't get a hold of them. Your data is the most important value to industry. Sorry, I'm having uh, work done on the house. So please, you know, just, just keep that in mind. Make sure that your data is actually going somewhere that will create a better drug for you. I, I couldn't agree more. No, with, with that sort of everything you say, uh, Liz. Um, the, the, the issue.
issue is sort of um, it's not sufficient if, if <laughs> there's just in, a couple of individuals sharing the data sort of um, to, to get this comprehensive set to find out really the specialized correlations. We, the more the more data, um, the better it is. And that's why sort of just giving individuals giving away the data, sharing data doesn't seem to be the sufficient solution. Um, and, and that's why it's sort of um, sort of a more more state government uh, regulation for, yeah, for, I agree. for the, for the data. I agree. It has to be at a, at a super large level. And um, I think that it goes back to when people started using the Internet and people were afraid of the government or, you know, companies going and looking and seeing what they were looking at. But the, the truth of the matter is mostly it was ubiquitous and health is the same way. We are vastly dying of the same things. We haven't changed it enough to have super outliers. So um, when people consider sharing their data, uh, please consider that you know you you are thus far in human history not a, a very uh, special case or, or major outlier. Please share your data. So Didier, did you get your question answered adequately? I didn't. And I also didn't notice that Daria has a question here about using the blockchain for storage of data. Yeah, interesting. Uh, did Didier? I. Um, Stefan was not answering yet, but I will speak about it uh, later. So let's uh, let's keep it for the others at the moment. Maybe if I, I just want to make a really brief comment, which I thought was quite interesting recently. Uh, um, well, well, anyway, there's a, there's already a war for the digital data taking place in the world, um, and we can see that with the Chinese firewall and China having the right to collect the data in China and, and, and sort of trying to get with TikTok and, and uh, uh, Alibaba and other companies trying to get it from outside of Huawei, get, getting it from outside of, uh, outside of China. And what I, I, what I find quite an interesting move, and I think this is, might be something worth considering, and I really haven't, haven't heard that, um, is sort of um, what is happening with the move to space with SpaceX basically, and SpaceX having the possibility of launching, they, SpaceX has more than a third of the satellites existing um, in the world. And in the future, basically, they try to provide uh, internet globally. And if they provide the internet globally, that means all the data flows via their satellites. Um, I just thought, I wanted to mention this is in this context because I think that would have um, I mean, because China has already reacted in so far, well, they see, if they see um, SpaceX as, as a threat to their security, then they would consider shooting down some of the satellites. And I think sort of the move towards space is an extremely important, um, is an extremely important, important move also when it comes to collecting data. Um, because now if, if this is sort of, and, 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 and SpaceX does, seems to me to be the only company, um, the others do, do space travel, but SpaceX is there to launch satellites and satellites to provide internet, and the internet is, means the, uh, the possibility of data collection. And I think that's in, enormously important for taking that into consideration, just as an additional comment. Well, what about the blockchain question? <sighs> Quickly. Um, it, it, I've actually I've talked to to Vitalik Buterin a week before he launched he launched Ethereum uh, about the possibility and didn't only want to implement it uh, for 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 um, currency for pay, payment purposes and I can see I can I can see the possibilities I I still have worries just concerning the scaling and energy. Uh, 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 the, the, the energy consumption and, and the scalability of blockchain. So these are my worries, which I have as a very short, but uh, uh, as a very short reply. Okay, so now we need to move on to Alexander. Fortunately, I don't have to read the German since I'm not very good at it. Um, so here we have Alexander uh, Tietz Latza, and here very. we go. Very well right pronounced. Thank you. Uh, it's hard to not just follow up with the um, with the discussion, but thank you. Um, could I share my presentation? Um, oh yeah. Yes, yes. No, no problem. You just do it like uh, sharing. Uh, no, there's no. Perfect. Yeah, hit the share screen thing. There we go.
So do you see the screen? Because I, uh, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. It's really, really great seeing you all, although I have to admit uh, seeing you in, in, in person in Brussels, I'm also looking very much forward to. So I, I named it EHDS, um, European uh, Health Data Space, a chance for the European Union to foster longevity. It's more what um, in my last job I used to be, uh, I used to work on research funding, and that's how I would have called a project. Um, and I don't know really the solution to yet. So I hope maybe with the help of you all, we find a good solution. So uh, let me also add, I don't speak, um, I speak in my own capacity. Uh, I don't, or the presentation doesn't reflect uh, the, that of uh, the opinion of the German government or the, the parliament. Um, why is it important that we talk about this now? I think it's um, a very special time because um, it's the first time ever that uh, the European Union, or I would say the European Union actually addresses health on a big level. And uh, I don't want to open up the pandemic discussions again, but really um, in a way, I think in Europe, it was, a, it was the time where the member states saw that a disease, illness uh, doesn't, doesn't stop at borders. Yeah, so uh, it makes sense to have a have a common strategy maybe for for health and also for sharing data. So I think that really I gave a push uh, to, to this idea. So um, when you see, I, I quickly move through the slides because I think the discussion is actually uh, much more interesting then. Um, they basically see what we expect of the European health data space um, to do. So, of course, for the patients, it's to have access to their own health data, enabling sharing data, change your data, control your data, and all that should be um, in line with the uh, general data protection regulation. Um, what's the question? Or I just continue. So for the healthcare system, um, it should, of course, uh, also foster longevity, but it's uh, probably also an idea to um, to, make, uh, to, to cut some costs, also to make better decisions for patients, therapy medication, treat patients more eff effectively and easily. Um, basically, it should provide medical history across European borders. So basically, if you, you know, allowing you freedom of movement and non-discriminatory. So if you work in the EU, uh, work in Sweden or, or work in Denmark and uh, you have an accident on your holidays in Spain, but you want to be treated or you are by chance, uh, you're in a German hospital so that all this data is, is accessible. So for the economy, of course, cost cutting, uh, standardization, um, the opportunity to, to use AI technology for the development um, of devices and medication based on all these millions of health data set. Uh, for policy, it should enable politicians basically to make better, better decisions and to make the healthcare system more resilient. For research um, to have this high quality and anonymized health data and that already opens up a lot of problems what we maybe discuss later should offer new chances for the European researchers for developing new therapies and medications um, so now we're getting to to the difficult part it's actually establishing this uh, uh, European health data space it's um, when we I, I chose Germany because they know best how, how we work um, and there it's already difficult at the national level. So we have 16 counties and each of them has um, their own basic government and has their um, data protection officer, for example. Um, so that leads to a lot of friction. Um, and that also leads to a lot of, I would say, delay in the process. Although if we compare ourselves to other Germ, uh, to other European countries, um, we lack in digitalization anyway. Yeah, so uh, it's quite a quite a stretch for us. Nevertheless, in the coalition of the, of the new government in Germany, which is now in place for for one year, um, there's this commitment that we that we really want to do it. Um, and that's again what it, what it should all do. And what we now tried is to. Um, 
uh, have some opinion of the Chaos Computer Club. The Chaos Computer Club is basically as hackers. What they normally do is um, they take what um, governments or companies uh, develop and uh, after one week or a month or so uh, they uh, find a lot of uh, problems with it and uh, tell you how to uh, or not they tell you but they, they say how it's not safe so um, what we would love to do is to um, get more of these people on board to help us with developing um, uh, solutions um, and not uh, not later fixing fixing the problems um so this is the this is the timeline in general and there you see that it's really urgent to act now also maybe to speak or it would be great for me to get some examples of other european countries how, how you do it um because i think if we set it up now in a good way it's really the cornerstone of, of a lot of good stuff in the future but um, as some other projects, maybe if you see, if you, if you don't do it right in the beginning, it takes you a lot energy and you waste a lot of time later to, to, fix, um, to fix the problems. So um, yeah, and with that, that, I'm open for the discussion. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, are there, let's see, there are some questions, not really. Uh, let's see, any hands up? No. Well, okay, then I will ask a question. What about uh, the possibility of an in, of individuals being given, you know, re requiring an opt in before their data is used? Yes, yes, that will exclude some types of data. But still, you would end up with a huge database. Yes, it's a very, um, thank you for the question. It's an it's one it's one option um if we if we have to decide between opting in opting opting out um the advantages disadvantages for 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 both let's say maybe a third option would be to like if you really want to share your data and um like let's say if you of course we need to find a way for the let's say normal person so who doesn't really maybe um spend so much time on, on, on um, thinking about, about the data or about for them we need one but maybe we can have an, a plus let's say which is more or less like a contract so you could really share you could really decide to share all your data maybe uh, that would be another a third option um, but for uh, when it comes to technical level I'm pretty sure it will be well, I can say I I hope it will be an opt out solution. Um, maybe maybe it will be an opt in with an opt out solution. We will see. Um, maybe it will be different for um, for the type of data. So maybe some data will be especially uh, even within health data. Some data might even be uh, might have different uh, different uh, set of rules. Um, that's yeah, that, that we will have to have to see. It's also an idea to just work with correlation points, so to, you know, to to take the research questions and then just grab um, grab correlation points in the data and not just have the whole data. What I think is the most uh, what a lot of data protection people see as a, as a big problem is um, to, to have all the all the data if you, if you don't really need them. Yeah, and then. On the other hand, I often see that data protection is just taken as a uh, as a fake argument to, uh, <laughs> to 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 maybe not um, put so much work in your system. So um, I, I actually I'm, I like data protection. I think it's it's just often misused in a way. Yeah, I, th um, I think it's uh, yeah it's off. I mean, I see it a lot if you should try to change something in hospitals. Uh, often it's just used as as, a, as an excuse. Yeah. Okay, I don't know who, who put their hand up first, but let's start with Patricia. Hey, Walter, they normally are in order. Oh, they are. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. This was quite refreshing. Uh, in your slide uh, on Chaos Computer Club, at some point, uh, you say merging mechanisms for delocalized data with free and open standards between research and healthcare system. 
uh, can you just develop a few seconds? What this, does this mean? It's totally elliptic and opaque to me. So what does it mean? I totally agree. It's basically this, um, I think in, Germ in Germany you would call Eierlegende Wollmilchsau. I think in English it's trade of all square, like basically a round square. Yeah, basically you want, um, you want so ah, yeah. yeah exactly so um that's what i say what what you want that's uh not and i have no idea really uh, how to reach that on a technical level so um an idea for the process could be to first make clear what takes priority and then then see what is really what is really possible because i think yeah it's more like a claim than uh, than something what would really happen yeah. go ahead jose uh, yes alexander uh, good presentation and good initiative um but you were mostly focusing um on uh, your german experience obviously uh, but uh, do you know anything about other european countries advancing on this and also at the european union level as well please yes uh, maybe i was jumping a few steps so it's from the european level um, so every uh, member state has to find a way to make that happen. So, and that's um, why I think it's so important that we talk about this now, because uh, ideally we, we, we don't have all different systems. Yeah? So, so what the regulation says, what should happen is that each member state finds uh, a body, uh, finds, finds some uh, agency in their, in their country, and then um, which, and this agency is responsible for complying with this regulation. Um, but it might mean that there are like a lot of different national um, regulations, but they should all fulfill this aim. And I think this is, there you see why it's problematic. <laughs> and it might be good, it might be that there are already a lot of, um, a lot of European or a lot of, um, um, best practices from other European countries, which could, let's say, yeah, be a model so that we don't all develop our own to comply with this common goal. But it comes from the European level, so it will happen in any case. Yeah, so the, the in every member state, the only way is, or the only question is, will it happen in a way uh, which is giving really an advantage? Or will it happen in a way which is slow and which will, will not fulfill um, any, any uh, uh, which will not help research? Yeah. Okay, Didier, go. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you, uh, Alexander. Uh, I will ask my, uh, only one question, very short, uh, is uh, how do you think, so uh, my conviction is, uh, the European health data space, like it is uh, supposed to be, it's uh, it's great. It's great. How can we? What can we do to accelerate this? Um, for example, well, I will come to this uh, uh, in a few minutes. But uh, there is uh, theoretically a great uh, announcement that uh, by 2025, uh, each citizen will have access to. Uh, uh, his electronic data and so on, but uh, I'm afraid it's not going to happen. So what can we do to accelerate things in your opinion? Um, I think in Germany, what one could do is to make a case for a system which is already in place in some other countries to really say, look, this is a model, this is what works well. Um, you have, I think already in France, you, you, have, you have in theory a good, uh, good way to access to you have the right to all your data and basically it doesn't really work uh, also for researchers you have a, you have a way but it's just what, what was the percentage maybe five five like 0 0.5 uh, um, uh, 0 0.5 um, uh, how do you say under 0 0.5 um cases of of uh so five out of or let's say 995 uh researchers want to have the data and just five get it yeah so so the the yeah. the, the chance of your um proposal getting through to get access to this is quite low so um but in theory it's a very good idea so um coming back to your question um not sure 
I would say for, for Germany, it's already an advantage to say, look, we in Denmark do it like that, it works. Um, and maybe uh, writing to your local, <laughs> local members of parliament to say that you're really interested in this initiative, that could already maybe help, yeah, to say, to see, because at least in my, in my opinion or in my experience, um, often um, the people who, who, are, who feel very strong about data protection, um, they have quite a strong lobby and writing to, to, to the members of parliament quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so maybe, and then often mixing up with then like this, uh, you know, the, the state uh, is, um, is, is watching everyone and stuff. Yeah. So really like making a very um, emotional case. So it might be helpful to also make a very emotional case um, that as a human, you have the right to health as a human, um, as, as a citizens of Europe, you have the right that your government does the best uh, for you to not die prematurely. Yeah. So, um, and keep you in good health. So that is maybe something what, what we could, one could do. Yeah. Okay. So Daria, she also, I think wrote her question, but I'll let her, please Daria, you always have great comments and questions. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, so yeah. I just wanted to ask uh, Alexander uh, if you check this uh, European Council uh, Convention for, uh, for Bioethics, of Yedo Convention, it's also called. There are strong restrictions on using uh, personal medical data if, uh, unless you have the signature in advance. So it makes it impossible to use all previously collected data uh, in some ways, in some cases. So uh, basically it's better to check it to make sure to uh, pre avoid these traps. So did you check it already or maybe you plan? It's good. I think I haven't really looked into it. Thank you. I, I, I checked. Yeah. There are also protocols that a bit mm -hmm. uh, make it things a bit better. I will uh, send it to you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we should move on. But uh, it seems to me that the data should be recorded at the healthcare provider level, where they have a standardized questionnaire that that basically precludes identifying the person that the data came from. Anyway, so let's move on now. Uh, Jean Brennan Alemant. Oh, I'm sure I got it wrong. Here we go. Yes. First of all, I want to thank uh, the Didier and all his team who organized this uh, very, very interesting uh, symposium. I want to thank as well the presentations which have been uh, uh, very uh, interesting but uh, let me try to find uh, my presentation and then you will hit the and share screen yeah my screen that you do not propose to share my screen. Normally you have a green button. Yes. Don't I press on down the screen. But do not propose. Okay, I didn't want to. Do you see my screen? Not yet, sorry. Sometimes you have to do uh, two times uh, to share, second, push a second time. Excuse me. But anyway, I, I will start without my slide. Uh, I repeat, I thank 
the organization. I thank the speakers. But my uh, understanding of all the studies and projects which are made uh, around longevity are very wide and it seems impossible to coordinate all these projects. Uh, I would say all of us, we do something like a wishful thinking action, saying we should coordinate, we should share our data. But at the end of the day, it's moving but very slowly. So what I decided, taken into consideration my uh, own experience, is uh, to develop uh, software uh, which will enable me and ILS especially uh, to uh, access all the website which are addressing uh, longevity. And uh, doing so, uh, I, I am working, uh, I launched a startup and I am working with the university in France, uh, University of Rouen, a biotech university, in order to develop this uh, software. And it has not been so difficult because you can find some tools working on big data and using uh, IA. These tools are uh, working, are doing scrapping on the internet. And at the same time, they do automatic ranking of all the data. So these tools are Parsub on one side and Wildfire on the other side. Probably people around this uh, symposium know these tools. And uh, we have already very good results which enable us to know which website uh, have the highest rate of visits. Having ranked all these websites, we are working with uh, the university and with the uh, medical doctors here in order to, to put some weight on this uh, website to see if they look uh, reliable or not. And th this approach, uh, I think, enable us to go faster than trying to organize data sharing, to organize all the world of longevity. The only problem I have, and I cite this opportunity, the only problem I have is uh, the funding. During the symposium, many people spoke about uh, funding and the uh, possibility to fund projects. So I cite this opportunity to, to tell you if you are interested of, in having a tool which uh, gives you a very good uh, screenshot of what is, doing, what is going on on longevity. Uh, I would say as Obre is doing, because Obre is a computer by himself, but uh, for the other, um, this tool looks um, very uh, efficient. That's it. You see, my presentation just want to highlight to avoid to make too much uh, wishful thinking uh, things. I have been uh, the vice president of a very big laboratory, and uh, uh, I really pay attention to actions which are efficient. Okay, that's it. Uh, just, just technical. Um, send me, uh, Jean. Send me your presentation, and I will show it uh, shortly. Uh, so, uh, uh, at one moment, uh, at the end of this uh, uh, conference. No, I, I think she, uh, if you, uh, she, Shivani has it as well. But, but I send, it, I send it to you again. I send it to you again. Yes. 
send, send it by email, you know, and I, I know how to show. Uh, that's it for me. It was tech. So any, any other question? So, uh, Walter, if you think you are speaking, you were muted. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, there's a question here. Do you have any preliminary data from Anton Kaluga? Uh, Kulaga, sorry. Do you have any preliminary data from your scrapping? Do you scrap only sites or social networks groups as well? Okay. It's in the it's in the chat if you want to look at it. Okay, Didier, I sent to you. Didier? Yes, yes, uh, just a second. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can answer the question. Yeah. I sent I sent uh, I, I sent to you the presentation. Yeah. Uh, yes, ah. yes, I have it. Uh, Okay, I will. Uh, I propose I will uh, show, but this is in uh, in French. The presentation I will uh, just uh, uh, show fast the presentation, and uh, I propose that you uh, uh, speak again, but very briefly. Just leave me a second. Uh, I share the screen, but for the, okay, I share the screen. Okay, I think you see it. Uh, sup, uh, okay, there it is. Speak again, but uh, yeah, slow, please. And and you say, oh, fine, yeah, I I, I will, uh, I, I will uh, follow. So this is uh, the the project of your company. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, I I'm not sure it's so, so much interesting because as I told you, my presentation is in French, but. Uh, you you can see up. Okay, but voila, the second page. As I yeah. told you, the targets of the startup, which is three S, which means survey of senescent startup. We are using, uh, as I told you two tools, very powerful tools, Parsub, which enable us to scrap uh, internet, visiting all the websites about longevity, including products, university, newsletter, anything, and using as well uh, what will while the fire tool, which enable automatically to rank at the, the website and to provide us with the main information about this website. Okay. That's it. Uh, it's not working very good. Okay, planning. After that, I don't have anything else, so I... <laughs> No, okay. I have only these five last, slides. The last okay. sli slide. I, I have only these five slides, sorry, and you, what you sent to me. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's it. It's a short presentation that will enable you to, to stay in line with your, your time frame. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's nice to get back to it. But uh, what about Anton's question? Do you have any preliminary data? On my side? Yes. Yes, yes. We, we, are, we are at the level, you know, of testing the fi final, final product. And uh, we have data. Yes, we have data. But uh, can you show at least anything, like any stats from your data? Because otherwise it looks pretty useless, like everybody no. does scraping. No, no, we, we are at the test level of our uh, software. So as per today, I do not have, but I imagine that if some of you wants to, to fund 
part of the project, I will provide you with the result of, uh, uh, or, or I would say the test we have. Ah, so far it's super early stage and you don't have any preliminary statistics of the, of the data. Did I get I it right? I, I have, but it's not in, uh, I would say, uh, uh, very uh, professional uh, format. Very well then, let's move on. Oleg Tatar Tatarin, is that correct, Oleg? Uh, here is his uh, biography uh, or, you know. Thank you. Thank you. If I understand correctly, uh, Oleg, you are asking me to share the screen because normally you can share the screen, but uh, I will try to share the screen. Is, th is that what you are asking? Hi, hello uh, everyone. Like, no, yeah. I just asked you to send it uh, to to everyone so they can just download it once they want. I guess it would be the be the best way. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, but okay. So, but then then you put that in the chat. Uh, you you send me a private message. You send it to everybody. That's it. You know. Yeah. Okay. And you can share here. That's uh, I copy paste. Uh, there uh, it is. Okay. I copy paste so everybody has the the link. Okay. You can go ahead. Take it away, Oleg. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, we're going a little bit like in the schedule, so it was a little bit in preparation, so it would be not that uh, as planned, but still. So, uh, hi, everyone, and uh, happy to, to meet someone, some colleagues who I know personally, like Jose, Aubrey, Lise, Didier, Lia, Martin, and uh, I'm very open to, to meet others too. I'm quite new. Uh, can you share screen? Uh, what's happening with the presentation? At uh, this moment, no. I will share it later. Okay. okay. So um, uh, I'm in the longevity field. Uh, is like only four years and a little bit new uh, to most of you. And uh, trying to figure out how my energy and vision can extend active lifespan. So during my journey, I learned things. Uh, well, you all probably know that people die of age. There is no one who died from the disease. Uh, I mean, uh, people die of diseases, not from the age, sorry. Every day, there are about 115,000 uh, uh, who die. And there are up to 25% death percent of the deaths due to doctor's mistakes in the countries where uh, they've been uh, counted. Uh, the worldwide medicine is based on symptoms. Uh, well, usual amount of tests uh, doing by the bio biochemical tests is about to 20 parameters only. Uh, you will get more tests only if something would be shown in these 20 markers. And uh, we believe it's already late. So um, medicine all over the world resists hyper over diagnostics. And we believe this is the, the, the key uh, to our uh, active longevity today. Uh, we learned that most of severe diseases uh, survivors, actually not the survivors, their healthy aging uh, was stolen from them from the end of their life. So no matter how promising it sounds, uh, people who survived, if they would be tracked earlier, they would have lived probably plus some extra years. Uh, then uh, I learned that uh, no matter how promising um, news headlines are, humanity is losing battle with death because until now almost zero trials on humans are being done. Maybe besides uh, uh, Yamanaka, but it's, it, it goes with the, with the, with the, with the eyes and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, which are clinical trials on anti-aging and longevity right now are be held on humans. So um, I found out that scientific and medical society is quite closed and uh, not so much transparency in it as should be. Uh, maybe it's because that some of previous assumptions uh, after some time passed were considered wrong and not everyone uh, brave enough to admit it. And uh, sometimes it's even misleading the society. Remember in July 22, there was uh, this revealed Alzheimer's images fraud case um, then I saw that there's a surprising uh, competition going on in the longevity field and uh, fundamental science is severely underfunded. You can, say, you can see how much uh, COVID was funded last year or two years in a row. And at the same time, I believe longevity and IT, and IT aging movement was on fundamental level funded with the, about maybe two blog, Hollywood blockbusters movies per year, which is, uh, uh, which, which is even, I, I don't even uh, have... Uh, uh, the criteria, how to name it. Uh, and the main thing which I discovered 
that we are programmed to die not only on the cell, cell level, but on the mind level. Because only being programmed to die on the mindset level can find some explanation why everyone is busy with everything, especially with earning money, than in the focusing uh, on breaking death problem, uh, which, uh, uh, well, with, with all powers uh, people have. And uh, they are focusing on everything uh, besides breaking the, the, the aging problem, which uh, uh, probably will kill them one day. But uh, uh, sending spaceships into the moon, uh, to the moon or to Mars or building the tallest buildings will not help. So that maybe explains that uh, there are less than maybe 10,000 professionals in longevity field across the globe today. And uh, compare with the amount of lawyers, for example, right? So you understand that uh, basically nobody cares about what uh, we all do in, in this field. And this is devastating. Uh, also, I learned that medical and scientific institutes highly bureaucr uh, bureaucratical. Um, they are uh, building uh, stupid barriers to share any data. That's why I believe uh, the, the data should be uh, shared freely without any uh, barriers and bureaucratical uh, laws. For that, for example, we uh, have made an anonymous to token for uh, avoid these barriers. So all the medical profiles which uh, any hospital wants to share with us, for example, we can share this anonymization token and they can anonymize it with just few clicks and give us without any personal data related to that uh, customer, I mean patient, and we can work with this data. I mean, all, that, all data scientists can, uh, can work. And can you imagine how many uh, data sets available uh, in open sources out of which we can make disease prediction models? Three million only out of 8 billion population, out of uh, maybe uh, 5 billion who died during last 50, 60 years. So there are only three million on open sources on which you can build, uh, uh, on which you can you, you, you can build uh, disease prediction models, and we use them all. And we have built about thirty disease prediction models based on tabular data and uh, images data, and that's ridiculously low. And uh, combining with this argument that uh, the closed source data, data is very uh, bureaucratical, so we are in the dead end of that. So since my uh, and this section is about big data, so we have like a, a, a great uh, dead end in front of us to use big data from the tabular and images data to make some prediction disease models. Some of the speakers yesterday and today, they said that prevention medicine is very important and the using of AI and machine learning uh, algorithms and so on. But uh, how you can train data if you don't have data, right? So uh, even, uh, well, going back to the, to the, uh, to the mindset, um, and uh, we, you can also see that we have 100 rooms, uh, 100 uh, uh, members in this, uh, in this room, and we have like 50 uh, seats empty. And we, uh, with Ilya, messaged this uh, uh, message to some uh, related to longevity and anti-aging uh, movement uh, professionals, and even they didn't join it. That means it, it shows even from longevity-focused people that maybe uh, what we are, we are doing is also not so much important for them. You can say that they're gonna lis uh, listen to the recording later, but still. So uh, my point is that <coughs> uh, going to, 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 the, uh, to the content of this is that uh, longevity has uh, huge, huge problems. And we believe that AI and, uh, and uh, uh, machine learning methods, they can resolve these problems. Look, for example, for the business model in longevity today. Uh, you all know that uh, tickets to summits, selling books, speeches, uh, and only nutrition supplements are the only four uh, business models in longevity, and nobody's selling anything besides that because there is no products for the, uh, for for longevity, and that's why the investors are not coming uh, into this field, not coming, uh, not uh, like like Bezos with three billion, which is very doubtful uh, amount, and um, uh, other significant investors, but I mean uh, like institutional investors who are uh, investing in ed tech or fintech uh, billions every every month, which are not investing anything in in every month to, to our industry. So why I'm starting all this, it brought me to conclusion that the only solution to live longer today is not to die and, uh, uh, is, and not to die by uh, curing the diseases and, uh, and uh, um, monitoring them. So it's meaning to avoid severe diseases, screening yourself on few hundred parameters as frequent as possible and bringing AI, ML and big data to focus. And uh, I decided not to change mindset of people because otherwise I'll be dead already. I'm right now 46 and I don't have time like uh, Steve Jobs who was changing the mindset and look where he is. He, he changed the mindset in 2007 and 2011, he was dead. Of course, you can say that it's not, it's irrelevant. He wasn't curing himself, but it shows no matter how rich you are, 
how uh, which uh, access to technologies you have and how much fund uh, funds and doctors and so whatsoever you're not uh, uh, guaranteed that you're going to live uh, longer look at the mother of bill gates she died in 65 or paul allen the partner of bill gates he died in 64. so i founded uh, in u.s uh, company longevity in time which started the research and development in early stages uh, diagnostics i hired 70 people from 25 countries with zero burn rate i mean they're working literally for free well of course i give them equity of our company but that's not the point they believe that with the coding they can't resist uh, early death and that's significant because i think with that business model i mean the, the model of people working with zero burn rate we're one of the biggest biotech companies right now look at, at our closest competitor icarbonics it was the biggest before Altus apps uh, the founder of uh, raised funds, like the one billion from Tencent Corporation, which has the WeChat in China, they raised one billion in 2017. You know where are they now? iCarbonics, Chinese company, which was led by uh, Beijing uh, CEO of uh, Genetic Institute, uh, Joe Wang, is bankrupt because they were like paying a huge amount of salaries, like Altus Labs does with uh, with, he, with 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 his scientific board, but uh, they haven't done anything. I mean, look at their website. They have like three, three people there and, and the late, latest news is from 2019. So uh, summarizing all this, we're making a, a digital biobank which can in a mobile app collect data because uh, uh, medical, uh, medical uh, institutions are not sharing with us. The open source is covered completely by us. Uh, then we decide to give uh, value to these users who are gonna share us with data. Uh, to give their uh, personalized predictions and recommendations ba based on our proprietary method of uh, uh, calculating uh, what's going to happen with them if they're going to share this data, I mean, uh, I mean the historical data, and uh, patented the method that anytime any part of the data changes, we recalculate all the risk predictions and uh, recommendations to avoid these risks. So uh, by this, we involve the mach uh, machine learning. Uh, of course, machine is, is programmed by humans and the outcomes of the machine results should be monitored by humans as well. But we involve machines to avoid this uh, huge amount of uh, doctor's mistakes, which uh, are counted in, in civilized countries and not counted in uh, not civilized countries. And um, uh, we attached this technology to uh, the evidence-based sources, I mean, like PubMed, and developed the, the method of structuring unstructured, uh, we call it, well, uh, big data of evidence-based articles. Like you as all scientists, uh, you have uh, your team, you have your um, employees who are researchers, right? For example, yesterday, uh, it was told that the Spark 7 uh, like has about 1,000 uh, evidence-based articles. I mean, who counted them and who read them all? I'm sure that uh, uh, there is a great flow of uh, scientific articles coming on different issues, and I'm not sure that everybody present in the room read them all. You, you read the summary, you read the, the abstract, you read some key, key things, but you can miss uh, some, uh, you know, the, the devil in details. You can, uh, you can miss uh, the details. So uh, uh, we attach this uh, early prediction, uh, early disease prediction model to the method of unstructuring structured, uh, of structuring unstructured medical data by well, we, we call it less primitive than Google search. So what we do, if you would ask any kind of uh, specific question, we can give you a uh, very detailed uh, reply based on evidence-based articles. And we can give you a link supporting that. And, uh, <clears throat> and we believe this is uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the great uh, combination of uh, early stages uh, disease, disease diagnostics and evidence-based uh, reports, uh, which can lead you to second opinion, clinical decision supporting system, you name it, um, with the real um, value of what, what your recommendations are based on. Because anyway, no matter how uh, Nobel Prizes in Autos Labs or uh, education of professionals, we're, we're all uh, humans and we can be calculated by, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 fingers, right? How many, how many could be in the board or in concilium, uh, so, so on. But when you will ask the same question, which you ask to the reputable doctor, to the big data of evidence-based articles, we can extract as many articles which relevant to your question as exist in the public uh, medical databases. And this could be thousands, hundred thousands, maybe, maybe tens, maybe zero 
but we're gonna we're gonna get them all, and it would not be irrelevant to to some you know noise when you you, you make a Google search uh, request and you get all the all the garbage which goes uh, uh, in the reply. It would be strictly uh, stick to your question, and very important for parsing uh, the same kind of um, uh, evidence-based articles on different languages. So, the, 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 of course, we understand that uh, English is the main language, but how many Korean and Chinese and or Russians are making not uh, um, interpreted uh, scientific-based articles and they are not translated in English by some, uh, by some reason? So we added to this method um, the translation, the translation of um, national languages uh, of, of that evidence-based articles. So, um, so this is basically it, and uh, just a few words uh, on, the, uh, on the summary of what we do in our company regarding uh, additional works on, on the longevity. We also believe, and I asked that question in the beginning of uh, yesterday's session, uh, the AI simulations. Like I said, there's, well, correct me if I'm wrong, there are no clinical trials on humans being held, and there is longevity paradox. How you can, help, can, you, how you can hold a, a, a longevity clinical trial without seeing this person leaves or, or dies in, in uh, 50, 60 years, you would say, okay, there are some kind of protocols by which you can uh, pr uh, predict uh, the, the, the trajectory that he will not die because of that and this, but come on, who, who can give 100% guarantee that the new drug or intervention uh, to fight the aging or the uh, makes uh, active longevity possible uh, will not get the severe, uh, severe side effects in 50, 60 years. For example, resveratrol, like uh, everybody's obsessed uh, drinking, drinking it. Okay, I, I mean the, uh, the vitamins, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the tablet. But who, who made a, a, a trajectory that this uh, resveratrol will not uh, drive us to some critical stage of something in 10 years, say? Okay, so I believe AI simulations of clinical trials is the potential, maybe small, but still a key to that locked door. And this is the other thing what we do. So basically it's a collecting of a huge amount of data from users and we plan to pay those users for giving them their data. And we ask them to play in our longevity game because we have realized during these four years of research, like, like I said in the beginning, people don't care about what we do guys and ladies, I'm sorry, but uh, they care about money. So let's invite them on, a, on, on our field and play on their rules, okay? So for that, we developed like longevity coin uh, um, cryptocurrency. Okay, maybe it's now worth of zero, like Bitcoin 2007, but at least we're the only application who are giving them something in exchange for uh, their boring um, uh experience in, in any kind of health app. Of course, we try to make our app not that boring. And in that presentation, which uh, Didier will share, you will have the simulation of our um, updated app with these uh, um, uh, coins and how you can link our application to your digital twin avatar in the game. And you're gonna see how this avatar lives or dies if you don't change anything with your health application data, which was downloaded with your health application. So in other words, we are trying to get uh, some monetary part, uh, the gaming part, into this boring process of anything related to health, which users think it is. You just check it out. We uh, tested two years ago. Uh, we made an advertising campaign like in, in, in uh, Japan and South Korea, in all other countries. Almost none of them uh, subscribed. But huge amount, like 7,000 people subscribed in, in India, uh, in Bangladesh, in Somali, in other uh, third-rate countries, well, I mean, India, of course, is a developed country, but I mean, from the uh, access to, to medical technologies, to medical labs, they, they are very, very far away. So out of the 7,000, we got 825 subscribed users. And you know how many of them were paying users? None. That means that people are not interested, even if the stake is their life. So during these two years, we made this uh, research on... Uh, on uh, the feedback of the users, and we made this new application. You will see the, you see this. So this is the one. The second is structuring of unstructured medical data, uh, data with evidence-based uh, uh, sources, uh, clinical trials, uh, simulation of clinical clinical trials, and uh, the, the uh, anonymization of medical profiles to to avoid the uh, the, the barriers. 
uh, bureaucratic barriers. And uh, the last, state, uh, last statement, I, I contacted most of you in different groups and sent you some requests that, that like, if you have access to medical profiles, please help us. If you have access to some outcomes of past clinical trials so we can make simulation on the past clinical trials on which we can make a, uh, then train the model and then make uh, the simulation of the future yeah. clinical trials, which would be high, highly uh, hard. Well, mostly none of you replied. I mean, even, even if we have warm leads with you. So uh, my urge to the, to the society, uh, help the companies like ours. If you don't like our company, no problem, help others. Share the medical profile data in anonymization an anonymized way and help the companies who are dealing with AI simulations with uh, um, sharing with the clinical uh, trials data on which they can be trained uh, and made new models. Thank you. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Oleg. I really appreciate your strident approach. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of questions right off the bat here, but it strikes me that people are in denial about the forces that oppose longevity. You know, I'm retired. The government has to send me money every month. So me dying saves them money. Uh, yep. And also there, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, are kind of, shall we say, racists or, um, uh, you know, population control fanatics. It, not everybody agrees with us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what I can say, I say about uh, aging, uh, anti-aging advocacy, uh, we filed a petition in 55 countries on 28 national languages one half year ago. You can, you can check it. Uh, I mean, uh, Longevity Dividend, Martin Odia was very helping us uh, with uh, uh, m making the proper, uh, proper um, uh, message. So the idea of this uh, longevity uh, petition is like uh, stop spending on anything besides, uh, well, not besides, of course, uh, start uh, spending at least 5% uh, of your um, uh, GDP uh, on anti-aging funda fundamental research. And you know how many we have signed uh, votes during one and a half year? No, 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 no. We are the biggest longevity petition in the world. And you can just guess 4,000 uh, votes only. If tomorrow, any one of you are gonna put a petition regarding a cat on a, on a tree, in one hour, you'll get 100,000 in any location. Nobody cares about that. So we need to, to make a game changer. We need to invite in our field, on longevity field, anybody, but to play on their rules because there's no time of uh, uh, changing their mindset. I'm already like 10% of my life in this. And you guys like maybe, maybe 20, maybe 30, somebody's 50% of their life. But you see that uh, there's no dramatical change. Look at the, uh, the topics on the conferences. Basically, they are most, more or less the same during a few, few years. I'm sorry that I'm, I'm saying all this. It's very uh, uh, short, uh, closed uh, audience right now. But I I'm, I'm really don't want to die. The only reason I started this company is because I don't want to die. And I, I'm tired. I was tired of going and begging um, to everyone, just give me this, give me that. And then I realized, okay, I'll spend the time on the product, making myself what I need. That's why I, I assembled. Uh, well, in the first year, we have we had only 20 people. Like, like right now, we have 70. We have like 100 in a row going to, to work with us, these IT developers, for free. Yeah. Because they don't yeah, want it's, to die. Uh, I, I, we, I think we all share your frustration in this matter where we just aren't getting things done. But look, there's a few questions here. We see Liz. Take it away, Liz. I, I just want to say thank you, Oleg, for your initiatives. You probably did reach out to us. Um, for us to handle uh, the medical data from patients is uh, a lot of red tape. So it's, it's very difficult for us to begin with. And we cannot just hand it off to other organizations. Everyone in the organizations has to sign off on compliancy. So it may be more difficult uh, for some companies to share data, especially if it's not their personal data, uh, than you think. Uh, and I can also reflect that we need uh, people to take a bigger interest in this area. We had the, the timekeeper kit, which we thought, you know, people would be very interested in. It was nine different clocks and 
uh, you know, DNA methylation, epigenetic uh, aging, it was the most advanced. And I think over a year we had 350 uh, customers and that's not enough to keep anything in business. So I, I definitely uh, share uh, your frustration. Uh, I do think that it's a matter of education and um, it's it, we've, we've had a lot of uh, blocking of that uh, communication to the general public for, for unknown reasons, uh, but hopefully we will have a better trajectory in the next year or two. Well, education is a nice word for it. What's really needed is out and out propaganda campaign. There needs to be just the way, I mean, you know, for instance, the propaganda campaign to, to uh, implement vaccinations. Imagine if we had a similar organized propaganda campaign to advance longevity science and so on. I mean, we, we would make huge gains. Why isn't that happening? You must ask yourself that. There's a, con there's a reason why that's happening. It's not just ignorance, it's conscious. This mindset of people, like I said, we're programmed on the mindset level. Well, it's it's political too. It's very political. You, you think Nancy Pelosi doesn't know about this? You think, you know, Joe Biden doesn't know about this? Yeah, of course they do, but they're not doing anything. So well, trust me, they don't know. They, they don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It goes yeah. back to Stefan's conversation of that we do need to share data, but we're still, you know, trying to find the devil and criminalizing certain mindsets of business in which, you know, actually translates medicine to people. So it's like we even internally have a lot of cognitive biases that we need to overcome in order to really get things moving. And I was not able to unmute before the break, but the truth is, is that healthcare should be free. This shouldn't be a profit center. Uh, human enhancement is a great area for profit center. Unfortunately, the new medicine of uh, extending healthy lifespan will blur the, the bounds of enhancement in uh, preventative medicine, but that's a great problem to have. So, you know, I do picture in the future as we open our borders and open our minds, uh, certainly there will not be a profit center to health because health indicatively is a profit center for the world. Mm. And we will be working on other problems um, in the entrepreneurship that are profitable. But right now, without generating profits and patents and things like that, you can't get investment in this yeah. space. So the data and the mindset and the profitability, and I think that you profit from a, from a good drug, you profit from healthy longevity, you profit from your data sharing by getting there that getting that drug faster. And so, you know, again, cognitive biases seem to be hurting our area more than anything. And a lot of people come to me, interviewers, and they think that this is just a hedonistic area because they have not been diagnosed yet. They do not know what it's like to have a disease. They do not know what it's like to be reached out by you know, 10 people every month who are dying in the next few weeks of something and you can't give them access to anything because it's not legal. You know, we have um, we have to almost live in the empathy of dying right now to solve this problem later. And so I think that we really have to amp up our communication and education to the world in urgency, the same urgency that was the shifted towards uh, a COVID vaccine because people were dying and people felt empathetic about it. Aging is killing uh, a lot more people this year uh, than COVID will, you know, combined the last few years. So I think that okay. uh, we have to talk better on that. So uh, j j I, I just a second. Can, can I just, just okay. one no, okay, quick reply? Then. Yeah, uh, Liz, please ask your lawyers, uh, do these uh, regulations apply to anonymized, anonymized da data? Because we don't need their SSN or mobile or anything. We just need 005 for John Smith. And you only know that John Smith is 005. And we have the 005 profile and that's it. And it's absolutely anonymous. You don't need to ask the consent of, of that, of that uh, person because you're not sharing anything linking to him. Well, the problem is like, for as example, uh, George Church and Harvard and the Human Genome Project uh, pointed out that with enough data, you could actually correlate the information back to a almost a specific person. And that as we have 
massive amounts of data will be more difficult to do is what I'm telling you than it is today. So yeah. that anyway, that was their, their positioning, which made it a very global mindset that with a whole genome sequence and a couple other of things, especially like your environment where you live, because it is tied to how long you will live, the air you're breathing and the food that you eat, um, that that was enough to uh, correlate to a specific person. So, you know, again, we have to break down the mindset of transparency and what is transparent and what is opaque. Okay, you know, so let uh, me, I, I really a, need to cut you off here and let Didier get in. We're, we're just one sentence. Minutes. Okay. One sentence. Uh, in the, our app, we collect historical data of users for like a few years, and then we plan to make uh, prediction models precisely to this user. Because right now, we make prediction to a pre uh, precise user based on general uh, open source data on which we trained uh, models. So this is a, a key, uh, including environment and behavioral and all that uh, uh, other parameters. But this is the key to have 99.9% .9 accuracy to you personally, we need to collect your own data. And it's possible only by such, such applications as, as, as this, because you don't uh, collect historical data of any of your, um, of your uh, clients for five years with like 400 parameters doing it like four times a year per year. Right, and this is the key to make a healthy longevity today. And we can make radical longevity up, up, up to 120. And we have this extra 40 years until fundamental science will develop something which, which like a like a pill. Well, you know that's it's not, it's not what I believe in, but like a pill, like right, you're gonna develop it, and maybe it will suit you in this 40 years extra time you want by the early stages diagnostic made by the historical data. That's why we say your data can cure you. Okay. So that was all exciting. If only open borders were expanding instead of receding. But Didier, take it away. Uh, you see, we have a little introduction there for Didier in the chat. And he's a great hero of the longevity movement. And here he goes. Thank you, uh, Walter. So, uh... Today, I will speak about uh, big data for longevity, how to better share. Uh, I will speak especially about the European health data space uh, and uh, the right to help, uh, to, to health, of course. So I begin with a few classical uh, facts about longevity. Most of you know about this uh, today, like uh, every day about 120,000 people in the world will die of uh, old age. And this is uh, in uh, European countries, uh, about 90% of all uh, deaths uh, in the world, about 70% of all deaths, and even in the poorest countries, more than 50%. So even in the poorest countries, like uh, Liz and others were saying today, it is cause number one of death. We know that there are three big categories of diseases due to aging, cardiovascular diseases, things are going better there. Cancers, uh, things are going better also. Uh, for one, uh, uh, for people of the same age, uh, death rates uh, decrease with about 1% each year. And neurodegenerative diseases, sadly, things are not going better there. Uh, but what people think is that uh, um, that the elephant in the, the elephant in the room, well, actually, most causes of death, uh, included COVID, uh, included uh, um, infection, all other infectious diseases, other diseases, uh, falls, uh, even road accidents, they are uh, more deadly when people are getting old. So aging is killing us all if we are not dying uh, sooner from other causes. Uh, and something that uh, many people forget sadly is that the uh, many people in the longevity field even, it's that we don't progress, we progress a lot concerning average life expectancy, but we don't progress concerning maximal lifespan. So the oldest person ever was Jean Calment. She died when she was 122 years old. She died already 25, uh, almost 25 years ago. The oldest uh, woman in the world today is only 118, the oldest man on, only 113. And the first person uh, who ever reached uh, 100 years, uh, one of the, the first well-known person who ever uh, reached 100 years is uh, was Terencia. She was the widow of Cicero. 
and she died uh, when she was 103 and 104, 104, more than 2,000 years ago. What uh, I think and what other people here think, uh, it's uh, very probably possible to find a treatment against aging in 15 to 30 years, but it will be complicated, expensive. And one of the uh, things that we can, can use, we should use, uh, is big data. Okay, there are reasons to be pessimistic also, and uh, we were, we were uh, having uh, um, discussion about this in uh, the chat, but uh, still, like, uh, like uh, um, Ilya already showed, uh, we had, uh, for the first time since the World War II, a decrease in life expectancy, and it is the first time. It was the first time in 2020, and sadly, it was the second time in 2021. Of course, it was uh, first caused by the COVID, but it was not only the COVID. Sadly, uh, okay. There are also also reasons to be optimistic. For me, the most important reason is that life has never been so precious culturally, especially concerning old people. If there if we had had the same uh, situation 20, 30 years ago, we just have, we would just have decided, let people die. They are old, they are not in good health and so on. Okay, facts, facts about big data for help. Now we are coming to the real subject of this talk. Uh, big data was the information first uh, in the scientific literature, of course. So this is the work uh, of Jean to find it and of others. Uh, I will not speak about this uh, further today. In your smartphone, still, of course, and uh, in the data uh, that uh, te tech giants are using, but for the biggest part, uh, in the medical institutions, in uh, 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 public health uh, administrations, medical doctors, and so on and so on. It has been said that 30% uh, of big data is health big data, so it is an, an enormous amount uh, of uh, data. Uh, for example, you have about 500 uh, healthcare apps, but from these 500 healthcare apps, as far as I know, there is zero, zero public space, uh, public app to share health data for all. So you have some system where, where for some systems where you can share, but nothing really made to be uh, able to uh, really, let's say, help scientists or even help the community. So we have enough health data in the world to know which clinical tests should be started immediately, to know which existing drugs have very probably positive and negative longevity effect. Uh, and but but let's be serious. What we have already at the moment it's only for small longevity progress, but it's also to prepare uh, real breakthroughs. Now a few words about uh, my region of the world big data situation in Europe. So like I said already, uh, when Alexander was speaking, you have a beautiful uh, text uh, in, a, in a communication from the commission to the European parliament. It's only one year uh, ago. It was written by 2025 citizens uh, should be able to share their health data with healthcare providers and authorities of their choices, of their choice, sorry. So theoretically it's beautiful. In 2025, you will be able to share your health data also with authority, and it means also with uh, scientists normally. In Belgium, let's take Belgium. You have uh, great places to uh, consult health data. It's called uh, Science and Other Organization, and you have something each citizen has is supposed to have access to uh, his or her own health data. Great, in theory. And here you have the, uh, the practical side for me, just only a few months ago, now it's going a little bit be better, but it's uh, written in uh, Dutch, uh, open door at and I will, the, sorry, and uh, the translation is access not open by the hospital. So most people have theoretical, theoretically access to their data, but practi practically nothing. There is also the beautiful, uh, theoretically beautiful again, health data out, so this is in France. This is a place where normally all uh, health data coming from the social security in France and um, in France, the social security is a centralized system where uh, many uh, health data are going. So theoretically, uh, it's there to share with, with scientists, but uh, practically the situation is 
one, you have to ask uh, three authorizations, uh, two, uh, all these authorizations are taking time, and three, uh, for many, many of the people asking authorizations, they uh, never arrive at uh, the at a real result. And at the same time, this is crazy, at the same time, when people are going to a, a pharmacy, uh, in France, in 50% of the cases, the health data that they use for social, social security is going to a private company, an American company called uh, Igria, and then sold to some to scientists uh, somewhere else in the world, and uh, so uh, for money. So the the health data for scientists in France to access the health data um, through public institutions, it's more complicated than to than to buy it. Crazy situation in Finland. The situation is 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 supposed to be far better. So they have a system of uh, opting out, and we were briefly speaking about opting out against opting in. So opting out, it means that people who don't want to share, don't share. Opting in, it means that people have to say that they want to share. The problem, if you have an opting in system, you have only a very, very small number of people who uh, are going in the system. When you have an, an opting out system, most people, even uh, except if there are big problems, most people will accept. So they have a system of opting out. Uh, the, there is an access to be paid for scientists, but it's uh, not expensive. The negative aspect is that, uh, as far as I know, there are no, not many uh, studies uh, who used already this data. I don't know why, by the way. And I was uh, inviting uh, representative of uh, uh, fin data and a representative of the health data for, for this uh, conference, but they were not uh, asking positively. Sadly, I will try again. Uh, a few words about uh, the legal and uh, de facto uh, situation in most countries of the world con uh, concerning this health data, uh, uh, health data uh, uh, way to use uh, way to use. So you have the obligation to share with private companies and public uh, entities when you are a private person. Actually, when, when you are going to a, a hospital, you have no choice and uh, you are not allowed to share most of your data uh, for science. So you are, when, you, when you are a group of uh, citizens, you are never allowed to be, leg to be really the owner of your data and to share it with scientists practically and uh, very often also uh, theoretically, even if you do decide to share, scientists will have problem if they use the, your data. And even if scientists use the, your data, they will have problem to, uh, to publish. So what should we do to have open solutions? First, I want to say, so this is going in the same direction as uh, Stefan uh, uh, Sorgner before. Um, yeah, of course, health data is sensitive, but health data is less sensitive than your political life, your sex life, uh, much of your private life, your, uh, uh, your life, uh, your, your data in banks, for example. And it, will, it would be less risky if health data were not to be sold. So uh, I think also, and uh, we had uh, already a beginning of conversation about this, I will also that at least uh, when uh, some work is made by uh, public, public uh, money, so it means, for example, with data coming from the state of coming from social security, uh, no patent should be allowed. And do, this would facilitate sharing of data Publication of negative results, very important, and research outside patentable fields. Very important also, this, this is for another discussion, but patents, theoretically, they are there to make sharing of uh, knowledge easier. So you have a patent, you have a monopoly, a monopole, I don't know in English, uh, for um, 20 years, but you are supposed to share your data your information, but actually, the practi practically, it's not going this way at all. Like we said, for example, uh, in the patent uh, uh, recently uh, acquired uh, concerning uh, blood uh, from uh, the E5 product. Um, so when you when you read the patent, the E5 product of Alcatraz, when, when you read, read uh, the, the patent, you cannot understand really what's there. 
So we should constantly, constantly remind that most people are willing to share health data for scientific and medical goals in, uh, in uh, Belgium, but also in other countries, there were polls about that. When you ask, do you want to share your data with your medical doctor, with scientists, uh, they say very, very, very largely, yes, 90%. When it is with big pharma, it's still a majority, but, slow, but lower. When it is with the insurance company, the majority is against. We should also always remember that GDPR, uh, are normally not above fundamental uh, human rights, uh, like the right to health. So we could share with uh, private uh, companies, but be careful. Some private companies, they, they use nice words uh, about open sharing without real sharing. So for me, but that's only my opinion, the best way uh, to share would be the uh, WHO. Sadly, they don't have any, uh, as far as, as we, as I know, but I'm almost sure, they don't have any project uh, to share uh, health data at the moment. So the best thing at the moment is uh, the uh, European health data space. We were already speaking about uh, this a little bit. And uh, so there is a proposal for regulation, great, from a few months ago with uh, uh, four principles, for, for great principles, interconnectivity of databases, altruist databases, so no use, uh, no possible use for commercial goals, it's related, and can be shared with uh, scientists after anonymization or pseudonymization, of course. There are other ways to uh, share data. I will not go in the details because I have uh, no, no time, but I know that there are other ways. One uh, is to use synthetic data, I'm not convinced it's, uh, it's really easy. So not data coming from real people, but uh, created data. Another solution it's uh, called uh, solid. It would be one kind of virtual place uh, that, the, that the citizens uh, manage, uh, can handle. And so uh, with the full control for, uh, from the citizen. And the last uh, category is all aspects related to federated learning, uh, quite complicated to understand, but in short, where it is possible to um, use data from other sources than your own source without having, uh, uh, without seeing this data. Okay, uh, of course, of course, of course, we should use uh, artificial intelligence for many uh, reasons. Uh, uh, one of the reasons is, uh, uh, yeah, for health, but the other reason is because uh, artificial intelligence has, has dangers, but uh, using artificial intelligence for, uh, for health has less dangers. It's, uh, for me, uh, negatively fascinating, I would say, that uh, the best uh, software of the world can correct your mistakes, can uh, translate uh, almost everything uh, almost perfectly. Um, and uh, but that the best software of the best uh, medical software of the world can still not uh, enhance your health and can still not analyze uh, health uh, data uh, better than humans in most cases. There are exceptions. The the, the most uh, well known exception is concern, concerning uh, protein folding, but but still it's not advancing a lot. I'm already coming to the conclusion. So what we need, uh, reliable shared big, big health data. So once again, we, or I don't know if I said it already today, uh, we uh, have enough health data. We, the problem is not to have more health data. The, this health data is there. The problem is to share it and also to have a system of curation. I had no, I has no time to speak about this. Uh, we need uh, fast clinical tests on humans uh, and also on animals, more research, a sense of urgency, Liz and uh, Oleg and uh, well, others were speaking about this already. Uh, use of AI, I said it all, all, already. So in a few words, uh, uh, a synthesis, uh, some uh, really one page summary of uh, what we propose a system trusted by citizens managed by a public institution or a non-profit organization where with an opt-out system, all health data anonymized or pseudonymized can, can be used for scientific research and not for any other use. 
to start clinical tests and to enable everyone wishing it to live a radically longer and healthier life. I know the last, uh, what you can do and what we can do is share you, well, because it's not your most of the time, help big data to start trials on animals, to start cl uh, clinical trials on all the uh, well-informed uh, volunteers know or support this. Thank you for your attention. Uh, so uh, there are a few organizations who work in this direction. Don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter, The Debt of Debt. It's free for the first two centuries. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Thank you, Didier. That was a very uh, uplifting speech or presentation. Um, now, I, Liz had her hand up. She took it down. So I noticed that what, one of those four points was that uh, no possible use for commercial goals. That seems ridiculous to me. I can't understand why that would be a a, uh, a principle no. that's worth okay. holding. Okay, I will maybe yes because I I know about the I I will come back I will come back a little bit more to this because it's also uh, the remark of uh, Liz. So I'm uh, people are in in Europe, but I think also in the US very afraid that their health data could be used, uh, uh, you know, for example, for insurance and so on. And this is the important point. Of course, after that. Uh, the fact that uh, scientists uh, from uh, from public auto, uh, authorities, but also scientists from private companies, can use their data for research, yeah, should be uh, should be clear also. But um, to diminish, to uh, to have less risk than people don't want to share, it's important to say that it is absolutely prohibited to have. Uh, goals, commercial goals related to the data of the people themselves. You mean, you, you know, yeah. so uh, yeah. I, I selling directly, selling directly products uh, to these people because they have uh, diabetes or something like that. Yeah. But I, I, I understand the difference and, and it's, uh, to be honest, it's, it's kind of uh, strategic that I uh, say uh, first only at the public level because otherwise people are more afraid. Well, one one thing more is it's strange because sometimes people are especially afraid of the state, uh, more than from private companies. Uh, like uh, people are less afraid to give their data to Facebook than to uh, to the state. And sometimes it's the other way around. So yeah, very I, good. I, I agree. I agree the, the, the remark of uh, of uh, Liz was correct for this, and uh, maybe I have to to make a kind of uh, a small uh, adding something in uh, mm -hmm. uh, small yeah. characters. Yeah. Yeah, and then I, I had asked a question also about how can we have fast data when people have to die? That's always been a big problem with just like in the database thing and so on. You know, the, uh, but but. <clears throat> uh, Somebody said, who was it? Oh, yes. Well, somebody somebody had said that, that you know, use use epigenetic age or something to to uh, to do it. Biological clock. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Is there any more questions? Yeah. Well, then, I guess I it's time for it. to wrap it up. Take it away, Didier. Yeah. OK, so <laughs> I'm changing. Uh... I don't know how do you say that in pet. I don't know in pet. That's Dutch, I think. So this is uh, the end of the uh, part uh, concerning the speakers. Uh, and uh, now this is a, 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 a conversation. I mean, a general conversation uh, about uh, the text that I was uh, uh, submitting. I saw already a few comments and i think that the comments were uh, they were uh, only uh, positive comments uh, typos uh, and things that i think uh, are uh, uh, easy to accept except maybe one remark uh, coming from uh, Liz, uh, but maybe my explanation was uh, good but before 
sorry, I have to share the screen and to find it back. But before that, maybe um, some people here have general uh, remarks uh, concerning these two days or concerning uh, this text in general. Or maybe not. Huh? You are not obliged, of course. But just, just great. Be... Just wanted to thank you once again for putting together an amazing event uh, that uh, that will also, you know, help us uh, advance our goals over beyond it. Not sure. And then the text is great. Also, as I wrote, uh, happy to find it. A couple of minor edits, but otherwise, it's a good design for me. Can, can you okay. send it again? So, can you send uh, it again? Yes, I, I put the link. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I put the link again uh, last time. Just uh, let me uh, put it for everybody, not only for you. Voila. I see also Oleg shared the recording. Please, of course, it will be just technical. Uh, this will be uh, um, for everybody. Well, it's already now directly on Facebook, but like a big uh, file. Thanks to Malvina, it will be in uh, each each uh, speaker will have his part, his or her part. So uh, I'm coming now. Uh, I will come back. Uh, so for the title, uh, I had uh, positive comments, and I had one comment from uh, uh, Liz. Uh, why uh, why it, this is not enough to improve healthy life expectancy? For me, it's here because in uh, for the first time we had decrease of life expectancy at, and at the same time we had increase of uh, science so i took the the small uh, change that the, the change that uh, uh, oh sorry the change that uh, Liz was uh, uh, proposing so here so to overcome the loss of life in life expectancy we need uh, uh, better scientific cooperation, increased research and a real government level commitment to progress. So that was the first uh, comment. Uh, uh, this is a proposal of uh, Martin uh, to add where humanity becomes more unified within the common struggle to defeat aging together. I totally agree with this. Like I said here, okay, to me, important point. Uh, I uh, hope, I think, uh, uh, that have a common enemy or more precisely a common goal is something uh, that can help not only for to defeat aging, but also uh, to, to be, let's say, to, to be better together. And by the way, uh, Oleg, no, it was one thing we didn't discuss at all is uh, all questions related to what uh, I don't know if Aubrey is still here, but what uh, Aubrey called uh, sometimes the uh, aging trends and what uh, psychologists uh, uh, call uh, the denial of debt or also the terror management trends, theory, the fact that the debt trends, yes, debt trends. Yeah, okay. my, 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 uh, my phrase is the pro, is the pro aging trends. Um, but it's pro aging little... trends. But it's a little bit insulting. Yeah. You know, you probably shouldn't put that in. You should probably say. No, no, no. But anyway, there, there is nothing about this in the text at the at the moment. So I think it's better not, okay. because yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, Sven was uh, asking, saying, uh, uh, wait, uh, this sound. Uh, I didn't see the, this comment. We, uh, yeah, yeah I, uh, I already adjusted the text by simply saying, and research plans should be pre-registered. Okay, yes, I think. So what uh, what was missing before, it was the fact, so like uh, I say something, uh, I say sometimes uh, public results before, during, and after, uh, and it is so the, the the research has to be announced, otherwise you can uh, uh, cherry pick, you know, uh, yeah, and uh, theoretically, theoretically, it's I, I never know how it's working, but theoretically, it's more or less an obligation, and certainly an obligation in uh, European countries to publish after the results. But uh, the sad thing is, is uh, in many cases, it's not uh, not done. Uh, uh, okay, this is, uh, I, I guess I guess you are referring, Didier, to uh, clinical trials because. 
when it comes to basic research, uh, pre-registration is something very recent and it's almost nobody who does it yet. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, should always be public at research plans should be pre-registered. Okay, research plans, it looks not uh, very clear to me. No, clinical trials maybe? No, 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 because then you are rest restricting to clinical trials. So we are talking here about including basic research. And the, okay, research plan, I... <laughs> the research plan is like, what methods am I going to use? What statistics am I going to use? And et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Maybe just, uh, I, I still don't understand exactly. So if uh, some real scientist, you know, not like me, can, can uh, if, if nobody is saying this is not good, it's okay. Uh, okay, then, so yeah. So if there are people who were writing comments the last uh, minutes, so it's more complicated. Uh, Supreme AI, so privacy is important. Maybe. Okay, I don't have. Uh, I, uh, da Daria, I why, why do you think this should be deleted? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not in favor of deleting. But I don't know if Daya is there. Yeah, I'm there. Okay, uh, okay so it's time to unmute. So uh, first of all, um, there will be a critics already to say that right. uh, we it, don't need it to do it. Uh, yeah. For example, it adds nothing. Yeah, it adds nothing. That statement. Yeah, AI has uh, its own risks, and not having AI is has its own risks. Uh, I don't even see the risks of AI in medicine, frankly speaking. Uh, we are going to, we did have round table uh, last year. Yeah, but that, that, that's just what I see, you, the, what I say. So AI is its own risk. And so AI in uh, health uh, is less risky. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, just let but okay, okay, I, I, okay. I think okay. I think we just, will have we will we will have critics if we don't put it in. Exactly, and they, they no will say we are just ignoring the risks and uh, exactly. making it all show like it's no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah there was also yeah. Uh, the yes. only risk of uh, AI in medicine is uh, when uh, too much right uh, or much uh, too much is delegated on it. So this is a risk of well, human operators. This is it. There is no risks of AI in uh, medicine. Maybe we can compromise here just by keeping that phrase in there, but then combining it with the next sentence. Say, AI has its own risks, privacy is important, but using AI. Yeah, that was the idea. First I did that, but then I changed. Okay. Okay. But uh, I, I want, okay, so we agree like that? Yes. Yeah. No, I think first. Yes. Uh, I think it's not necessary to say about the risk, but you can uh, go as you wish. As for privacy, it's important. Uh, there are ways to ensure privacy. We yeah. don't have. But I, I want, I want to say, uh, Daria, I, I don't agree that AI for uh, even for medicine and longevity has no risk. You know, because when you when you use AI to make people live longer, you can also use just the other way around. Eh? So uh, I, I, I mean, uh, I'm uh, here the advocate of the uh, the devil, the devil. But I, I think it's good to use AI uh, in uh, medicine, health, and so because there are less risk. But say that there are no risk related to uh, AI in medicine doesn't look uh, why to me uh, because of this. You know, because can uh, I say? Can I say? Uh, can I say, but, yeah, uh, uh, I think AI definitely has a risk uh, simply by providing your own kind of medical advice. Um, AI is not uh, some, oh, yeah, you know, right. uh, uh, oracle. So I don't and know that, if you want to make a, a special case about it, but AI can definitely screw up. <laughs> and, and we know. Okay, so I think we, we agree with uh, what is here. Uh, this is, that, that was the proposal of Liz. I think it's okay. Uh, so this is disappearing if I don't, this is coming and this is disappearing. Uh, okay, but no, I, I propose it's, I, I, I propose uh, to stop now to change because except uh, for 
For no, please, please, who is Lama Anonym? <laughs> because my, my, okay, I, I, I accept this. Ah, it's Walter. Walter, stop, please. Please, please, please. I accept this one because I'm fixing. It's, uh, I'm fixing your English. Yeah, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. you, you. That's not true. Supp suppressing. Uh, okay. No. Okay. You no, can't. No, no, you, you should not, not start a sentence with but, for example. Uh, I, and, I, okay. and and if you say it's stronger yes. than ever, that's enough. There's no need to say. Yeah, in I, I agree, but this is not. But uh, but I read in one uh, not important. I read in one document that you can begin sentences by uh, with the word but uh, even if some English speaking people think the contrary. Yeah. Look, okay. We've got to, we've got to make this sound like English to English speaking people. Come on. Yes. 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 Oh, I agree. I agree. However, yeah. Okay. Okay. But okay, now uh, let's say uh, I propose uh, are there so for uh, typos and so on and for change, uh, com, uh, commas, no, how do you say, punctuation and so on, uh, we will uh, uh, finalize this. Do you have uh, comments uh, about things that you uh, disagree uh, or that you want to add? Uh, I think there is uh, nothing more except uh, one comment uh, about uh, of Sven. Should we say something along the lines that the elderly will not be longer since? I'm not sure. Uh, well, I would say we can use we can add it or not. I think it doesn't change. So let's try to add it. If but but uh, Sven, can you find a, uh, a place to to add it? If uh, nobody uh, disagree, okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking in this. Uh, the result will be a world, and then you have multiple points, and one might be that uh, if we have okay, uh, yeah, elderly so people we, being healthy, then we will no longer uh, look at them as being a burden. Okay, so we put that uh, uh, as a so somewhere. Uh, I think about the second point where one, human one, well-being. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This. 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 Uh, you change in this direction. Let's say. No, don't change it. Don't change it. Add it. Add, yeah. Add it. Yeah. Uh, you add it. Okay. Can be. Uh, the elderly will not look around, but okay. So maybe where. Maybe. Uh, I fully agree with the proposal of Swen. Okay. So this is like this. Yes. I think it's okay. Up. Take the question okay. mark out. Uh, where do you see a question marker? You, you, you did it. You did it. You did it. Or somebody did it. Okay. Okay. Can't we just. Uh, no, 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 no. Moonshot, I disagree. Moonshot, I disagree. Moonshot project. Why, why do you want uh, a moonshot pro project? Uh, because. Uh, I know that there are people who think there was no moonshot. <laughs> yeah. No, in any case, it was only once. Not a good the word, example. The word moonshot is very fashionable right now. It's the kind of buzzword that people like to say. Yeah. So I, think it, I mean, I think it's a good. I one. mean, for me, for for me also, there is the moonshot project. We should call it a moonshot. Yeah, and and then and then you have the Manhattan project, but the Manhattan project is a nuclear weapon, so it's. A, Less sympathetic, so I refused. We refused. Marx oh shot Didier. Marx shot. Oh, no, no, no! Please, 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 <laughs> please. Okay. Well, it, it adds absolutely so, nothing, but okay. I disagree. And, what does uh, it add? Nothing. Tell me what it adds. Well, Walter, I, I mean, it's that something that adds. people understand. Moonshot pro project. Uh, it's. Uh, when you look at it, it's, it's clear that it's a big project that is going to uh, okay. cost uh, money and energy, but that All will right. be useful. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't mind that it's in there, so, but I wouldn't say it adds much. So I'm asking no kind of a formal uh, vote. If you uh, uh, agree 
uh, with you, uh, um, let's say, uh, if you agree uh, globally, I mean, you don't have to yeah. agree to everything uh, you put, uh, you think, uh, you finger, your positive finger, please, please is it, uh, it's compulsory. To is do it, it where the elderly will no longer be seen as a burden or will they no longer be a burden? We don't want to falsely change. Perception. No, be seen, be seen. Be, Why be do you seen, say that? Be Why? Because here it's a psychological aspect uh, who are there. Uh, and actually, actually, Walter has a good point here. We want to say both. Why don't we just say be or be seen? Yeah, uh, exactly. Okay. Be comma or okay. be seen as comma. Yeah. Actually, okay. they largely are a burden on society and they're denying it doesn't make it go away. No, but the point is that we'll... Yeah, you, 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 yes. yeah, that's the... Yeah. I agree with Aubrey's... Okay, good idea. Yeah, but it's kind good of idea. criminal just to say it like it's against human rights that they are burdened to say that. No, they're, they're a burden. Human rights are not. I mean, yeah, they're not. They're not, not contributing to society. You know, believe me, we all know old people that are not contributing a thing. They are nothing but an expense. But we still want to maintain oh. them. We have. As a human right, we want to maintain them, but they're still a burden. It's like they agree that they're burdened. We shouldn't. I don't think it's a good idea. Sorry. Well, I mean, the idea is to, right. to, 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 to the, the whole point of this declaration is to develop technology that makes them no longer a burden, right? Right. So when we're saying this, this is the result that will happen, then I think we should say both. I think we should say that they won't be a burden. The way they are now, and also they won't be seen as a burden. Yeah, yeah. So, I think we agreed about this. Huh? We be a burden or be seen as a burden. Okay, I think it's good. I, I think that okay. I don't need to probably add anything in here, but I, I've noticed that one of the problems that, for instance, when we spoke in Ireland at the Dublin event and we had we were on the the panel, there seems to be a lot of. Um, separation between what's a social burden and what's a financial burden. And so um, certainly socially, uh, we would like to have our grandparents alive, even if they're sick, and they may be able to watch grandkids or do various things uh, for a family, but they may be an economic burden. And, and, and it would be nice to have the humanity in the document only if possible. I don't want to make things more complicated, but sometimes you can simplify things just by um, putting, you know, the correct uh, phrasing, uh, you know, what kind of a burden, a financial burden. Not not all old people are a burden on the system in every single way. Yeah, I think actually, you know, I, I'd like, I'd rather like the reader to be able to interpret this either way, whether social or financial, depending on their own, their own, their own, their own emphasis. I think kind of not saying either of those things allows people to read it the way they want to, which is good. <laughs> okay, clients. Yeah. I suggest we reread it once more with all these changes before releasing it. But uh, for Monday. Yeah, yeah, we will. We will. Okay. But no, I'm asking. Uh, uh, let's. Uh, I, I don't find how to vote uh, for myself. So. Uh, um, okay. So. Let's uh, uh, say, is there somebody still uh, who is uh, who doesn't want this text globally? Are there people who abstain uh, and are there people who uh, agree? I don't know how to do this. Uh, we can just use the, uh, the thumbs up in reactions. W once again. Hmm? Show some in reaction. You know, the, the smiling face uh, next to recording. Do what Elia and I do. In the chat. In reality. I know we do in the um, uh, menu. I'm sorry, I'm lost. No, in the menu, you show reactions like uh, you can raise hand or you know uh, laugh and things like that. Okay, I see. Uh... It it keeps disappearing. <laughs> That's okay. No, you, you, you just can raise the hand. That's all. Yeah, or to put uh, yes or okay. Yeah. Or you can put uh, the, your hands. Okay, but I don't see the hands. Uh, Shivani, help me. Do you see? 
I see. Yes, I, I do see them. They keep disappearing, but uh, I've not I, seen you uh, know in the no, chat. But right so. now we are 33 participants and we were 60. So I, I suppose it would yeah, be sure. more intelligent to circulate this text now. Yeah, but I mean... And they will say, I'm okay, I'm not okay. You, you know, it's too complicated because, uh, okay. yeah, uh, people, all people the others are, the same. but we, yeah, so, yeah, and also it was announced in the, in, in the thing, uh, in the, yeah, uh, but it disappeared, uh, anyway, it looks like yeah, most it's people always. that they agree in the oh. chat, if you do not agree in the chat, just type, yeah, no. yeah, okay, yeah, yes, so at the moment there is no no, and of course you can also abstain, and there are also hands. Okay, and there are also people writing a message to me, but yeah, okay. Well, one okay, nice so thing about about doing this in in the you know the Google Docs is that there's everybody can enter their suggestions and then somebody is yeah. the final proctor and they say i accept i don't accept yeah. after thinking about yeah. now you have to remove your ego you have to think you know try yeah. not to just say yeah. i said it this way and that's the best way that's that's of a course. natural tendency that must be fought of course but okay here we agree globally about the text so it means that we can uh, change uh, concerning uh, the way to write it but we cannot change the 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 content itself okay so i propose to stop the recording here uh, so 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 i stop Thank also you. to